guys. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome to another episode of Scientology Stories. We have Claire Headley, Mark Fisher, and Janice Gilman Grady here today. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, while we're just getting fired up here, making sure we're all good, um, I like to put up uh, the comments, a little scroll here. Tell us where you're from, where you're watching from today. Um, we've been doing, um, for the past few days, we've been trying to do lives a little bit more earlier uh, in uh, Mountain Standard Time so that we can uh, pick up some folks in Australia for the start of their day and in UK for the end of their day. And that seemed to be pretty popular the last time we did it. So we figured we'd do that again today. And we're going to do the same thing, same thing tomorrow. So, um, so yeah, thanks for joining us. And, um, yeah, we've already got uh, – oh, perfect. We're already up to uh, a few hundred people in here. So that's good news. Um, you want to uh, – Claire, you want to read out where people are coming in from? Sure. Yes, we have uh, – hello from Lisbon. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um Tumaka, thanks for joining us. And Cheyenne Calkins, Colt Lake City, Utah. Oh, nice. Very good. <laughs> I saw a Melbourne, Australia. E. I saw Dunbar, Melbourne, Outer Australia. Banks, North Carolina. Nice. And Carolyn, hi from Melbourne, Australia. Thanks uh, for joining us. Yes. Sandy Del Rey, hello from Omaha, Nebraska. Carrie Bemis, Cleveland, Ohio. Thanks for joining us, Carrie. Gary Jackson Moorhead in the house. Hey, hey beautiful people. Hey, hey Jackson. Hey, Jackson. <laughs> uh, Matt Denny. Hi from Chile, Norfolk, England. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Good to see you here. Dale Whitmore from Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Yay. <laughs> Escaping the cultiverse, eh? Hello from very cold and snowy Godrich, Godrich, Ontario. There you go. Mitch, Mitch Brisker, Brisker in the house. Hey, Mitch. Oh, look, we were just talking about you, Mitch. Look what I just uh, oh, yeah. showing off here. <laughs> I yes. was raving about so, your book, Mitch. Yeah, we were all talking about your book and all the stories in there of all the stuff that happened after we left. Yes, everyone watching, if you haven't gotten a copy of Mitch Brisker's new book, definitely do so. I'm in the middle of reading it. I can't wait to talk with you about that, Mitch, hopefully. Oh, Diana Johnson. Okay. Uh, hi from Pittsburgh. Linda. Hey, all greetings from Hollywood, Florida, San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Purple Groovy 69. Hello from St. Louis, Missouri, St. Louis City, Missouri. Japan of Green Gables. A joke. What do you call a group of two or more Scientology imp based security chiefs? A very Jackson Moorhead. <laughs> okay. I, saw, I think I saw that on Discord the other day. Oh, really? Uh, Alex yeah. is here too. Oh, <laughs> nice. Hey, Apostate nice. Alex. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Catherine Olson. Yay. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. You're an amazing moderator. Thanks for being here. Love Food Kitchen at Lafton Fox waving from across Brighton. Nice. Nice. Wow, that's awesome. We got a ton of people in here. Yes. Um, Th this video is actually based off of a comment on the Blown for Good channel, and I just wanted to put that up and read that, and that's why we're here today. Um, if you have ideas for videos you want to do, put it in the comments, and sometimes I'll read it, and we'll do it. It said, uh, it's Jake JB2360 about a week ago. He said, I would really like to find out more about L. Ron Hubbard's houses and offices. Like, do they really set his clothes out and keep his automobile running as if he is alive and here? And where are Dave's houses and how do they compare? And I really love this idea. And that's what I think I said in the comments. I said, I love this idea. Look for this on the channel soon. And then he wrote back, I will look forward to it. Thanks for the addicting info. So um, when we were, so I was at the base from 1990 to 2005. Um, how long were you there, Claire? 1991 to 2005. Okay. And when I say base, I mean the Int Scientology headquarters in Gilman Hot Springs, California. Um, and then Janice and Mark were also at that property, but they were there for many years before us and also in the Sea Org for many years before us. And essentially, as soon as I got there, like I got there in May of 1990 and you guys buggered out in August of 1990. Yes. August and September. Yeah. For me. Yeah. So, so they were, we are, our, our ships in the night. Yeah. Our crossover was just a few months, but, um, but, uh, 
But fortunately for me, Dave talked about you guys all the time after you left. So we got to kind of uh, hear some stories about you. And at least I could get the, uh, the, the sense and the idea that you guys had been there for a lot longer, um, many more years before that. So Janice, what, how, how long, when did you get there? And then how long, like in the Sea Org, and then how long were you at the Int Base? Well, the Sea Org, I went in in January, 1968. Okay. At, at 11 years old. Yeah. And then I lived on the ship for nearly eight years when we moved to America in 75. And then um, I moved out west in 77 when uh, La Quinta was set up. And then in um, the end of 78 was when we moved to the gold base. Um, after having done a movie shoot there, we ended up buying it, having found out it was in bankruptcy. So that became our summer headquarters. So I moved there just before Christmas in 78 and was there until August 1990 when I took off. Wow. Okay. And then what about you, Mark? How long were you in the Sea Org? And then how long at the in base? I joined in 1976. Uh, David Miscavige was my roommate. He had just dropped out of high school the month before. He was 16 years old. I just graduated high school. I was almost 18 years old. And then I went to the internet. I was in Clearwater up until 1981. And then I went to the international base for the first time in gold for training. And then eventually I was up there full time starting in 1982 until I left in September 1990. Wow. Okay. So we have, okay, good. So this is a perfect, we've assembled, I believe, an <laughs> ideal group of people to answer the question. Of We're an ideal how org. Did, how did L. Ron Hubbard live his life and what did he have? Because J when Janice says she was in the Sea Org um, at the time period that she said, um, that the only Sea Org was with L. Ron Hubbard. There wasn't a lot of Sea Orgs floating around that that weren't having to deal with L. Ron Hubbard on the Correct. ship that he was on. Uh, and you were in the sea. So I'd say out of all of us, I think Janice has the most sea time of her Sea Org career. Um, Not to mention the fact that she worked daily with L. Ron Hubbard six hours a day, seven days a week, all through her teenage years. She was for, well, for 11 years. Later. Yeah, wow. Years. So yeah, so we we're gonna get the L. Ron Hubbard perspective. Pretty, I I say we're gonna be pretty dead on, and then between all four of us, we all worked with David Miscavige directly for many years, individually in different capacities and different organizations. So we would be familiar with his stuff as well. Um, and when we were there, when Claire and I were there, she was in Religious Technology Center. So she was in David Miscavige's organization. And then um, and he was um, he was sort of between 1990 and the 2000s. That's when he sort of embraced this. I can do whatever I want kind of attitude. So um, but let's start with L. Ron Hubbard. So when you were um, first showed up. Um, Janice, um, L. Ron Hubbard, he had the St. Hill, um, house that he had the, they, yes, they he had the manor. manor. Just, yeah. That yes. this manor where he lived in East, Gr in East Grinstead in England. And I then, showed up in 66 and yeah, he had the manor. Um, there was a nursery quarter with four rooms where the children all lived. They each yeah. had their own room. He had his own room. Mary Sue had a, her own room. He had an office. She had an office. Um, there was a big kitchen. They so and they had a cook. And Ken Urka was his butler. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your, fo we your an focus went off for a second, Janice. I don't know if you have to if it's autoing or something or if you have to touch it. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know it's how okay. to fix it. Okay, it's fine. Anyway, so um, they had a nanny who looked after the children, and Mary Sue had a steward or a, someone that helped her. And then Hubbard had his butler, and they had John Henry the cook, and okay. that was that was it. So, how many people do you think total was taking care of L. Ron Hubbard, like be tending to him? Well, for tending to him personally was just Ken, and then he had a communicator, okay. Bill Carino, okay. who he worked with. So a handful with of people between the cook, a handful and the of butler people, and okay, yes. And and when he went to Rhodesia, he traveled on his own to Rhodesia. And he would travel first class. Mm -hmm. 
and and then um, when he was in Las Palmas later on, he had one person with him. It was Virginia Downsburg and later on my mother. And when you and guys were in Las Palmas, was that a house or was that what was what was that? It was a house. I never saw it because it was before my time. Okay. Uh, I showed up on the um, Royal Scotsman in January of 68. And my mother had already been in the Sea Org and she'd been on the Avon River and then also working in the house. Now on the Avon River, he had a room, a captain's quarters. And that was, you know, that was cleaned up and the flag order don't don't unmark a working installation was because my mother took the porthole off in order to clean it and she needed help putting the port, porthole back on and shouldn't have removed it in the first place. But he just had a cabin and he ate with the crew or, or sometimes food would be taken to him in his cabin and he would be served by this Commodore steward, his, his tab, that's what he drank at the time, that's like a Coca-Cola type of drink. He used to and drink tab. Yeah, he used to drink oh, tab. Awful tasting stuff. Yeah, it's it's worse than diet coke, which I love diet coke, but tab was oh awful. I remember mm. tab. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so that that was his quarters on the Avon River, and I did sail with him once on the Avon River. We we lived on the Royal Scotman, but we did a second mission into time, and I was the messenger picked to go with him. So I got to sleep on a hammock in the forecastle. And that was one of those treasure hunting uh, missions. Yes. He was going to yes. recall where he'd buried treasure in the last life or where it was stashed. And then they'd get, you guys would go and right. retrieve it. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So now on the Royal Scotman, I was on that from January until May and he was not aboard. He was on the Avon River and then he was at a house in uh, Marseille. Okay. And, and I never went to that house in Marseille. But then he came to the back to the Royal Scotman. He'd been on it when he when it was originally purchased in November, but he came back in May and his quarters were set up where the smoking room on the prom deck was turned into his research room as in his office. Okay. And that was a that was a nice big room sitting midships on the ship at the very top. And then if you go down the stairs and over to the port side on A deck, he had, there was two staterooms. One was Mary Sue's and one was his. And each stateroom was the size of four regular cabins on the ship. Okay. And, and they each had their own little toilet room and a shared bath shower, which had doors going into it. Then he had a cabin for an auditing room. Later on, it was decided because all his books were in storage to take four cabins next to his stateroom and turn that into an auditing room and library. Okay. So he so he had his stateroom and then he had his library, and he and upstairs he had his research room. Now, working with him, he had a steward and an assistant steward and a cook. Okay. And then he and then he had Ken Urka as his communicator checking all the traffic before it went into him. And the steward took two cabins for laundry rooms to do the ironing and to put his clothes and that type of thing because he didn't keep his clothes in his stateroom. There was really no room. And so it was all just hung up. The bunk beds were taken out and lines were put up and his clothes were hung there and ironed in there and washed in there, washed in the sink. You know, we didn't have a washing machine. Everything was hand washed. Yeah. And um, was he crazy about the chemicals and the smell stuff back then too? Not at that time. Okay. And at that time he used to shower with pear soap. And every time he'd come out of his cabin in the morning and he'd, you know, I'd go reporting for duty, sir. And then he would go up the stairs together. I could smell the pear soap as I'd follow him up the stairs. When you say pear, you're talking about the fruit. Yes. The brand. And it was a oh. it was a it was a brand called pear soap made wow. with pear. And oh I could always goodness. smell that as I would follow him up the stairs. <laughs> wow. Well, because 
for those of you who don't know, in the sea organization, anything with any sort of um, fragrance or perfume or any smell is forbidden for use in the sea org. So your shampoo, your conditioner, your deodorant, your lotion, anything that you need to put on your person is not allowed to have perfume in it. And you can't wash your clothes or wash your hands with any sort of soaps or detergents that have any perfume in them. Yeah, they had to be that's unscented. All. Right. And that's... And, and you know... I don't remember him having a problem with the smells until more like 73 when he came back from New York. Okay. Mm. Before that, before that, mm. I don't remember it as being such a big deal and we didn't have to rewash and re-rinse all his shirts and move over to coconut soap and uh, natural soap with no smells and stuff like that. I don't remember that being like that earlier. Huh. So something happened in New York that uh, he, he yeah, or, or it came up in his research because in the perfume thing, he talks about how they used perfumes to sort of help implant people and to yeah, it's called like it, it was rose perfume. Everything had rose right. perfume in it. Yeah. 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 Right. Even, even when you bought something, it was perfumed. You know what I mean? And it was yeah. blamed and he, on psychiatrists on the whole trek that yes. they used yeah. perfume yeah. to trap people. Yeah. <laughs> his, his temper, I mean, he'd get really wound up over these smells, you know, and I, I'm, you know, he smoked. So he, I right. would smell the cigarette smoke, you know, <laughs> but he still having problems with all these perfumes and these different smells. And, you know, sometimes it's like, go find that smell and we got to run off and, oh, it's coming from a restaurant on the dock. You know, oh, because oh, you go, you're smelling that's all the good vents. One. <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. That's like a yeah. We we tracked it down. It's uh, there's a big fat fellow over there that's wearing a lot of uh, aftershave. You know, just like okay, we can't do anything about that. <laughs> right, oh right. Oh my but gosh. If he started getting allergy shots, Kimma would give him allergy shots, and that would calm him down. But as soon as that was starting to wear off, I think it was like, you know, three weeks later, four weeks later or something, you could see his temper building up again over smells. Hmm. Wow. That's yeah. wild. Okay. So, but basically he had, he lived and, and ate the same food you were eating. It was just prepared by his own cook or they may have prepared even a different food or better prepared food for him. You weren't, he wasn't. Uh, there wasn't a, a dinghy or a, a, a what do you call it when you do the uh, uh, transfer from the boat to a boat that then takes you to the shore. The tender. No, it wasn't no, a tender had... bringing him tender. lunch or. No. Oh no, 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 not at all. He had, you know, the the cook was set up with a cabin and it was turned into a kitchen. And at first, he started eating with his aides, but. He would he would like to finish cycles or finish things before he'd go eat. So the aides would be sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. So it got to a point it was they were waiting too long and losing production time. So he they set up his own dining room, and it had been an officer's lounge, and it was turned into his dining room and a family lounge for him at the bottom of the prom deck stairs down at A deck. So he started eating there with Mary Sue. And of course, they then got a purchaser who would go ashore and purchase different food for the cook who would work out a menu. And then from there, the cook would um, make it. And there were times where you'd go to get, you'd go to take a bath. There weren't a lot of baths, but there was two baths on B deck. And that's where the galley was for the Commodore. And you walk in and there's a lobster in the bathtub. A live lobster the, <laughs> that's it's a It's going to be dinner later. <laughs> it's going to be dinner later. And that's how I learned about lobsters because it's like they're alive in the bathtub. Wow. And and that happened a few times, but most of the time, you know, they just they got fresh food from ashore and we weren't allowed to eat fresh vegetables. Everything had to be cooked because you we were in Morocco at the time and um, it you don't People know what sort of diseases or what sort of uh, different things they have there. So you have to cook it to just right, for safety right. reasons. Exactly. So, yeah, he had a cook and he had and a purchaser and he had a steward and an assistant steward. You know, one would serve the meals, one would clean the cabin and dust it, dust the auditing room and that type of thing. 
But in terms of the food he was eating, he was eating burgers and pasta and, you know, the same kind of stuff you guys were eating and steaks or, you know, what it it wasn't. Or, you know, they'd send in half an avocado and he'd put like olive oil on it and lemon and salt. And that w- that's what he would eat as an appetizer before they brought in his main meal. And um, Mary Sue was, you know, she would for breakfast, she'd have some yogurt and some granola. And he would have some eggs and um, clipper, which is a, um, a fish. And, and it changed over time. And they would make him like fresh squeezed orange juice with an egg in it. But to drink until he got his breakfast. Okay. But like a raw egg just mixed in with orange like juice. Like a raw egg mixed in with the orange juice. Rocky Ma- style. Rocky style. <laughs> yeah, it's just gonna say right. <laughs> right. I mean, and, in the seventies, that was probably a thing. This is how you can get some protein without having to cook it up. You just eat it. Right. And, and even later, when he came back from New York, he would have progest. As soon as he woke up, we'd have to pour this progest in to a glass and then add hot water and mix it up and take it down to him. What's progest? It's a extra protein. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. That just came in a bottle and was this gooey stuff. And Janice, didn't anyway, somebody tell us that when he was in New York, Janice, didn't somebody tell us when he was in New York, Jim Denkowski and then Paul, was this, they cooked food Paul for, for Ella Rich. Uh, they just cooked it out of a can or whatever. I mean, he would eat whatever they would, whatever they would make for him, right? Yes, which reminds me of something else he used to eat, and that is, but yeah, when he was in New York with Paul Preston and Jim Dean Kelsey in 1973, they just threw on whatever, and the three of them would sit down and eat, and he wasn't into the smells or anything like that. One time he did comment to Jim Dean that his pants needed to be washed, otherwise they'll be standing up on their own. <laughs> <laughs> and just just so you know mark and claire that that time period is that photograph of l ron hubbard with his hair really long and greasy yeah, yeah. i'm sitting yeah. at the desk that yeah. photo was taken by jim den and that's when he was in new york city and there's yeah. and there's stuff all over the bed oh, yeah. and his hair yeah, is yeah, messy yeah. and he's you know it, yes yeah. exactly yeah. i and almost th- used that picture for the thumbnail but um, but both him and Dave were doing a hand thing, and I thought, you know what? I'll use the one where they kind of look like they're doing the same little uh, little uh, gesture there. Right. Wow. And, so then, and then- Janice, Janice, I have a question. Yeah. So um, obviously, we're going to get to David Miscavige later. But was Hubbard physically abusive of staff that you witnessed? No, there were some instances. Oh, sorry. Uh, I remember, I think, three instances. One was for a guy who had slept with um, Hubba's daughter. Oh. And uh, he ended up getting um, a fist coming at him, you know, as to why her. Yeah. And um, another one was Otto Roos. And I told this story before on Otto basically trying to say that he'd gone through LRH's folders and LRH was a rock slammer. (laughs) And um, I was running messages back and forth and then Otto followed me up there to try and talk to him directly and Hubbard took a swing at him, but Otto dodged it. And then another time was with Norman Starkey. Uh, My sister was there for that one where Norman – apparently nearly took us onto the rocks and how he was furious um, and took a, and took a swing at uh, Norman. Okay. Wow. So otherwise he was not physically abusive with his fists and, you know, hitting people and trying to run them down with cars and things like that. No, that did Just not verbally. happen. But verbally he'd, oh. like, he'd rip into people. And and it ordering yeah. cruel and unusual punishment, I'm guessing. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. Uh, the chain locker. And, you know, growing up, seeing people go to the chain locker, I justified it in my head because I would hear the stories how in the Navy, sailors would come back drunk and they're thrown in the brig until they sober up, which is the equivalent of a chain locker. And so you're talking that corporal punishment from the 40s and 50s 
and here we are in the 60s with it still going on. And then where, the overboarding too. Right. And and the over and the overboarding. Uh, commit your sins and errors to the deep and hope you arise a better Thetan. And that was for people who had messed up on things and also for auditors who had not gotten a well done session. They had they had not done well with their PC. How many they were times, ordered overboard. Right. How many times do you think you saw somebody thrown over? Or how many times do you think somebody was thrown overboard when you were on the ship? Like I went over once. No, but I mean, like, was it 20 times or 100 times oh, or 1,000 times? Every, every day there were, during this time period in Corfu, every day the muster was on the well deck and they'd stand there, the MAA, and read out who was going overboard. So it was a list of people. Uh, oh, yeah. And then yeah, and it wasn't, oh my gosh. And it so wasn't maybe, just Hubbard who ordered them. It became a regular thing of, he pissed me off, so he's going overboard. Yeah, you know, and Janice. Janice, weren't this the class eight course going on then too? These were class eight students, right? Auditor trainees. That's that's where it seemed to start with. Was yeah, the class eights, and they had to audit PCs. And my mother was even thrown overboard because she didn't get, you know, a good session on her PC that one day. So the next day she was overboard, and even during the Hubbard's class eight lectures, um, Bob James and Duran Robertson, I think it was, started play fighting on the stairs up right where the lectures were going on. And I ran over and I said, stop, stop. And they finally stopped. Well, when Hub came out, he was like, what was that noise? Because it was, it was going to mess up his lecture. And yeah. I said, well, it was Bob and Duran. He said, you order them overboard. So I ordered them overboard, and the next day they were called up and thrown overboard. Wow. So it was a lot. It was a lot. Oh, yeah. It was and local. Also, you're in a harbor, right? So it's nasty. Yes. It's not the, clean, it's so, not the cleanest water you're ever going to roll into. No, depending on the tide. Yeah. But the locals got to the point where some would come out in their little rowboats and line up to watch, to watch the people going overboard. <laughs> Oh, so they knew. They're like, oh, they're about to have oh, us. this is entertaining. Oh, yeah. We're going to miss the oh, yeah. show. <laughs> Eight o'clock. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. God. Hey, guys, oh, wow. get up. I know we got to go fishing, but we got to see these. There's a whole bunch of white people going to get thrown in the water off this boat over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. And I remember, like, Leon Steinberg couldn't swim. So instead of him going off the aft well deck, which was higher up, they – put a life vest on him and threw him out the cattle doors, which was maybe four feet above the water. But even that, when you land in the water, that life vest is buoyant and it's going to pull his head up like this. And I remember watching it going, oh, my God. And 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 he just started flapping. He couldn't swim. Oh, my and, goodness. That's, and Amos, me, that's the crazy thing because they did that at the base too. There were people that couldn't sl swim. And when right. they would have to go in um, at the at the international headquarters, we didn't we weren't out at sea, but we did have a, 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 a what was called a lake. It was sort of like a an oversized yeah, was, muddy pond, but like um, a cattle pond. Yeah, but yeah. people would get thrown into that. But it was only three feet deep. So if you right. got thrown in, you would just stand up and you'd be okay. Yeah. Oh my. Well, I remember God. Amos Jessup telling me he was the captain of the Avon River, which was docked right behind us. And there was someone who went over who couldn't swim, and Amos ended up fishing him out of the water. Hmm. But they were still around. They were still good. They just he had yeah. They were still good, but them, yeah, they would just keep on their head up. They didn't yeah. know how to swim and oh, get to the God. ladder to climb up it. Yeah. So that then, that to me is one of the things that I always thought was really crazy about the base that they did this thing overboarding. But then it was like, no, no, they, when they did that, they used to do this in the Sea Org when it was at sea and they did it a lot more and a lot more frequently. But I never, well, I, I never spoke to anybody who, who knew, like who was there enough to go like, yeah. oh yeah, this happened all the time. But you're saying it, it was, so it would happen at that muster in the morning, but could it happen at any other point in the day or was that the designated time? No, no, it was always designated for that time in the morning. Okay. So, so that was, and, it, and it would come out in the orders of the day. Sometimes it'll be in the orders of the day saying so and so is to be thrown overboard. Wow. And if you and look so, at old orders. Yeah. Sorry. So so it was done yeah. at muster in front of everybody. Yes. 
Unbelievable. So it's humiliating. Yes. Yeah. yeah right. No, but exactly. Mark, I was, say, was it double? Was it yeah. double? Get yeah. you. Well, I was going to say, Mark, during the entire time I was at the Int base in Google Maps, there was no overboarding. That didn't start till after we left. So that must have started after you no. got there because. I don't ever remember anybody being overboarded. I I remember Rick Asneran ordering somebody because I remember coming into MCI to go to dinner and they and Rick had made them stand in front of the doorway soaking wet. Oh, I, I've never heard this story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. when I was first there in 1990, there was definitely overboarding. Well, at, well, actually, after the flood, overboarding. Then there you go. That's probably yeah, we're gone. That's after we the flood, overboarding became a regular mm -hmm. practice yeah. at the property, right. and that was in August of 1990. So it was right before you guys left. Is when it became sort of. Uh, well, and, and that's that's when in. James Byrne, who had been on the ship, and Greg Woolhair were in there on mission, right, right. after after the flood. Yeah. To get a, you know, may become make the gold base a sea org unit again. Yes. And we're marching drills and to remember all that drills, yeah. drills, drills. And, and yeah. that's probably where that came from. And James would have gotten it from being on the Apollo. Yeah. Right. right. But now the insanity of the, uh, the overboards, word gets out to the bases, like in, in Denmark, in, in England, and Los Angeles. Other so sea the, organization bases. Other sea organization, yes. And so like in Los Angeles, instead of overboarding, they would take a big hose and hose people down. Yeah. But you take, you take um, I think it was in, in Denmark when Doreen Casey was there, she started flushing people's heads in the toilet. Oh, it's oh called. I think it was, I think the nom proper nomenclature is a swirly. That's what that's called. A swirly. Oh, that's okay. When you get a swirly. Well, yeah. she's okay. the one who started that. So this wasn't Hubbard who started the flush and heads, but the overboards kind of people go, oh, all right, we should take that punishment, but they they can't do an overboard, so they come up with some other stupid idea. Yeah, right. They have to have Pajamas. an equivalent of that in their yeah. locale. So we'll talk about that a little bit later because that also okay. is something that happened with Dave as well. But yeah, Mark, what did you get? Mark, yeah, Gary Jackson Moorhead's in the chat saying that was him, Janice. That Rick <laughs> I thought it was. I thought it was. And, and him. Rick put a Rick put a sign around his neck. Anyway, wow. I thought it was Jackson, but I was like, uh -uh, I better not say that because I'm not a hundred. <laughs> but that's the picture I kept getting was Jackson standing there uh, soaking. That wet. was me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> now, 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 when was that, Janice? That would have been 1990, early no. 1990. No. No, no. Oh, the no, Rick Asneran. So that Rick would have Asner. been. So it would have been like 81, 1981. Yeah. You so know, what are the chances that there's four of us and the he person does, that you were YouTube. talking about is in the chat of the video that we're talking about? <laughs> Um, yeah, small world. small world. Okay, so yeah. now back to back to L. Ron Hubbard because we got it. We, we still have to cover Dave. So yes. Okay, so that was on the ship. So then when everything moved to land, and Hubbard went, he was in where? So after New York, okay. he came back. So then what happened after you guys? He came in, back to the ship. Yep. Yeah. And then when we moved from the ship, like, well, and there were times we moved ashore for a month or two, and he just stayed in a regular little house or something. But it was a rented then, house. He, they didn't buy a house. Well, in he he oh. owned he did own a house in uh, Tangier. Okay, and it was and it was renovated to build him an auditing room okay. because there wasn't there wasn't a room for that to also have a room for the messengers and the steward and Mary Sue and her communicator. So a room was built on the patio for him to have a soundproof auditing room. Okay, and and that was done before the ship sailed. Okay, but but. When we moved ashore in America, a condo was rented for him in Daytona, about two buildings down from the Neptune Inn where all the staff were living in motel rooms. And that was done until we closed escrow on the Fort Harrison. In and Clearwater, Hubbard, Florida. In Clearwater, Florida. And that was 10 stories high. And there was a penthouse at the top. And Hubbard's plan was to live in the penthouse and the crew would live in the main building and the public would be in the cabanas. Hmm. That was the plan. Okay. And, and he would have an office in the Clearwater building, the old bank building. Yep. 
However, just before we were moving, the guardian's office said, don't move into the penthouse until we have safe a safe um, base in Clearwater and everything's good. So that's when instead King Arthur's Court, one of the buildings over there was rented so in that Hubbard in mm. Dunedin. So Hubbard and the messengers, there were over 16 and a household unit and an external comm and, you know, would all move there. And we did. So Hubbard had an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment, him in one room, Mary Sue in the other. Huh. And, and these then, were just regular apartments like you would see today, just an apartment. There was nothing special about them. I've right. seen photographs of them. I went, wow, I can't believe that they, they lived there. Yeah. Wow. And, and they, then, they were separate than the flag, let's say the flag base, because they were yes. in a different location. Uh, totally it was a 15-minute drive. Okay. 15 minute drive from Dun Eden to the Fort Harrison. Wow. And okay. and then in that same apartment building, it was like two story. The bottom story on one side was all garage. The others, there was two on the other side. But his office, he had an apartment with his office in it, and external comm was also in the other room. Okay. So, so if he wanted to get a message to somebody, it was one room away. They would get the message. It, and then they would exactly. Send it and it. yes, yes. Okay. And and people would come in and out, you know, they'd be doing the driver for the van going back and forth. We'd come in to pick things up. And, you know, Hubbard's office was right there. It didn't matter. Anyway, so then when he had to take off and we went to Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., he had with him Michael Douglas, who handled his communications, Kimma Douglas, Michael's Kimma Douglas, who was like cooked for him, did his laundry or, and that type of thing. And then they had Jim Jankowski come and then Gail Irwin, Gail Riesdorf. And Gail mm -hmm. would just dust and, you know, so forth. And his lifestyle was that when he would wake up while everyone else was sleeping, he'd want something to eat before he went in session and Kimmer would have a snack in the fridge ready for him. He'd just go to the fridge and feed himself and then go have his session and go back to bed. And even on the ship, messengers, we would open a can of um, corned beef for him. Oh, yeah. And, and he would eat corned beef and some cheese and crackers that we cut up for him. Um, and that was it. Okay, so there was no no nothing elaborate. Okay, good. Okay, and then and then where was the last place that you knew where he was? I mean, well, you were at the base. He was at Creston when you were at the Gold. No, base. no, no. Well, once we when we moved to from when he moved from Washington D.C. to he to L.A. area. Yeah, he lived in an apartment there while the La Quinta properties. WHQ winter headquarters were purchased. And he, that was and in then Los he got, Angeles. He lived in an apartment. He lived yeah. not, it's just outside of in the greater Los Angeles. Yes. Oh, because I, I was told he lived With in Alder City in Hemet. Not well, he did. That was later. That was oh, later. Okay. Yeah. So we're now in La Quinta yeah. and we've got several properties, and he has his own house called Rifle. Yes. Okay. I've heard of Rifle. That Rifle, he had an office. The messengers had an office. He had a dining room, living room. Mary Sue had an office. Mary Sue's communicator had an office. There was a kitchen. And then there was a guest house, which had a kitchen and two bedrooms. Mary Sue in one and him in the other. And it had a swimming pool. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they always had separate bedrooms, it sounds like. Yeah. That's well, he, they were always on different schedules. They always had separate yeah. bedrooms. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, they were always on different schedules. He might yeah. he might stay up till six in the morning, uh, case supervising or doing management stuff, and Mary Sue would go to bed at three o'clock. Yeah, you know, so and she'd be up before him. So they had different bedrooms. Okay. Wow. Any, anyway, so that was rifle. Then when he had to skedaddle out a rifle. He stayed at a at a hotel until, and then when we all moved to uh, Hemet, to San Jacinto or Gilman Hot Springs, yeah, uh, some apartments were rented in Hemet. He did not move into the base. 
though he was going to live up at Bonnie View, which was like a 2,000 square foot home with, um, what, three bedrooms, I think. But it yeah. was small. Yeah. But he lived in It was a single Hammond. level house. Bon yes. Bonnie View. Yes. Story. What we yes. often refer to as BV on the channel or right. Bonnie View. That was the right. L. Ron Hubbard house at the top of the hill on the property at the international headquarters. Um, right. It, it was, was there when you were there. Right. It was originally called the new Gilman house because there was an old Gilman house yeah. on the property that was further, you know, down and away. Anyway, so instead of him coming to the base, because Bonnie View had, Bonnie View was not really messed up or anything. It was just, yeah. you know, it's just an average but house. for security, but for security purposes until things settled down because they were hunting reporters were hunting for him and so mm -hmm. forth. He moved into an apartment that we called X in Hemet. Wow. And, and there he had a one bedroom apartment that he lived in. Mary Sue was in LA at this time because she was fighting her legal. legal yeah. She was about to the, go to jail for the largest infiltration right. in the United States government right. in history. Right. right. <laughs> so she was not part of the scene at this point, though they wrote letters every day, okay. but he lived in a single bedroom apartment. But Kimmer would pretty much go in there and cook him meals. But sometimes she'd cook them in her apartment and take them into him. And he had he had just a round coffee table that he did all his work at. Not a coffee table, a round uh, little breakfast nook table. Mm -hmm. And the messengers would sit around there with him and go through things with him, or he'd sit there and talk to us. But that's where he did his work. He had a couch and a TV with a VCR and a, the little kitchen. Okay. And that was it. And even with, if Kimmer was on Liberty and Sanaa was got, wasn't there, yeah, I remember he and I, we went to the grocery store and we got some steaks and came back and he taught me how to cook steaks. Wow. And we just sat down and had steaks together. But there was none of this elaborate stuff. <sighs> yeah. But he did, have, he did have a lot of messengers. Yeah. Right. You know, we at first it started with one per watch and then it was two and then on the ship it was three and then there was – trainees or ghost messengers learning. So those were always around and okay. they were always trying to figure out what to do. So someone has the bright idea. Oh, let me hold the ashtray for him. So it looks like I'm busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not the odd man out here. Just, just exactly. exactly. <laughs> but the thing that, the thing that was, um, that strikes me though, and the, everything you've t said so far is that it didn't seem like you guys were afraid of him. No. No, but so. there were times I'd tell you that I didn't like his yelling. Yeah. And there were times where before I'd go on watch, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I'm going to make sure that everything is smooth. He's not going to yell at me. I'm not going to mess up. And I'd have to try and get myself in a mental state to go out now, take on that challenge. Yeah. And, yeah. and there were days where, yeah, he'd get mad at you, but at the end of your watch, he'd say, thank you, honey, you did a good job. You know, or we'd, we'd get acknowledged for what we had done. Yeah. It wasn't a constantly ragging on us. You know, if he got mad about something, he yelled about it and then he calmed down. Okay. And yeah. And there were, I don't remember any brutal punishments or anything. I was never locked up in a hole. Yeah. I was locked. <laughs> I was locked up for 11 days for tr wanting to leave. Yeah. When, when they were trying to assign me to the RPF as a list so one RS. Yeah, and that was in La Quinta. And wow. I know he knew about it because I got a letter from Mary Sue, and the only way she would have found out is through him enough. writing to her. Yeah. Right. Wow. How, how old were you when that happened, Janice? Uh, I just turned 22. Wow. Because on my birthday, I remember I was, I was already 21. I just turned 22, and I was sitting – in his room talking to him about my birthday. And I said, and I was like, Oh, I'm getting so old. I'm going to be 22. And he's like, that's still young. I'm like, no, it's, you know? And he said, well, what age would you like to be? And I said, well, I like 21. He says, okay, well, today's your first anniversary. Wow. So <laughs> Yikes. Janice, okay. I, have, I have a question. Um, how did LRH or Hubbard line up with David Miscavige in terms of paranoia? And by that specifically, I mean, David Miscavige was 
is one of the most paranoid people I've ever met. Was Hubbard like that? Like, were there actually uh, reporters he was hiding from? Or was a, was a lot of that paranoia? No. No. You know, we lived through a whole period. I was on the ship for eight years. We sailed around. We got kicked out of countries. He kept trying to get involved with the local government, and that would get us kicked out. But every country we went to and every port we went to, he would insist we do open house. Have the people come, you know, show them a good time, have parties for the VIPs. And he'd just sit in his office working away and all these people are streaming by, looking hmm. in the window at, at this man working away, with no clue who he is, you know. Yeah. And yeah. he didn't try and hide from that or anything. And then when we moved ashore and... The reporter shows up at King Arthur's court in Dunedin. That's when he was like, uh, yeah. and took off. He, he took off to D.C. But then when he was in D.C., Kim put um, fake hair in his hat and put glasses on him and stuff like that to try and make him look different. And he would go and sit in a park, which worried Kim, and he'd sit there photographing Secret Service people with these little spy camera hmm. and and she was always worried he was going to get challenged if they caught what he was doing. But there was not that. He 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 was around the staff and the crew. Yeah. But yeah. And he didn't try and hide from them. He would talk to them. He'd shoot movies with them. You know, even when he was at X, um, he had a van and we'd get in the van and we'd drive over to the gold base and he would film with the crew and then he'd go over into Bonnie view and he'd sit there and have dinner or a snack, you know, and then go back to shooting or whatever. But he, yeah, he was afraid of IRS and, and reporters, you know, so well, but, David, you know, Miscavige, 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 David Miscavige was afraid of the Sea Org members. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Janice, I want to also, Janice, I think you'll agree with me. I also want to point out he didn't have bodyguards. Okay. He did no. not have, uh, there no. was no security force. The security were the messengers that were with him. You yeah. know, yeah. when he went well. off to Sparks or Reno, he took Pat and Annie Broker when he went to Creston, but he took. Pat and uh, Dee Dee. Claire and Dee Dee in right? Sparks. Yeah, so he just took his messengers. He didn't have an armed bodyguard or anything like that. Wow. Yeah, and he would walk around the streets and so forth. I mean, we used to go in the grocery stores. I showed up one day for watch wearing flip-flops, which I got a lecture about, and then he took me to a shoe store and brought me a pair of shoes, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, he was not afraid to go and talk to the Sea Org members. Okay. Okay. So then, and so then that really brings us to when he was at, what, what, what's the next thing? Then he was at Creston after that. That's when he, yeah, after, he took after off. After X. Yeah. After X, um, he took off with Pat and Annie and went around in an RV for a while. And then they finally got Creston, but he still, that house wasn't renovated properly. So he lived in the Bluebird. Which is and, he had just Pat, and he had just yeah. Pat and Annie and Sarge with him. And they were the ones that lived in the house and they stored stuff in the barn, the horse barn. And so, but, yes. they, but he was living in that bluebird motor in the blue park next to right. the house. Right. right. And he would get out and he would walk and he'd meet neighbors and talk to the neighbors. They didn't know who he was. You know, he'd grow in his hair again and yeah. had a different name. Somebody told me when he dressed up because he wore like a bolo and he had these like big white suits. And I think it was Gary Weesey told me that one time they were walking and someone said, is that Colonel Sanders? He looked like Colonel, <laughs> like a Colonel Sanders grew his hair out. <laughs> That's what he looked like because it was all white yeah. and he had yeah. and he dressed in a white suit like Colonel Sanders with like a black bolo. It's like, is that right. Colonel Sanders? <laughs> wow. Okay. So then that sounds that sounds appropriate to what we've heard in terms of right. you know stories and people who were there and that sort of thing. Um okay, well, I mean in terms of David Miscavige comparing them when um what why don't you tell me Mark 
from the beginning because you were roommates with him in Clearwater right. when you first got into the Sea Organization there. Um, and you guys just lived like Sea Org members. You just were living in an Yeah, apartment. we lived We lived on the ninth floor of the Fort Harrison in, in a dormitory in one of the hotel rooms. There was yeah. about six of us in the room. And he had just joined the Sea Organization in the Commoners Messenger Org. And uh, he was just like everybody else. And then then from there, I, I checked out at that point. But then Janice was the one who actually, you, you're the one, you were the, uh, the commanding officer in Clearwater for the Commodore's Messenger Org, right, Janice? And you're the one who sent him to La Quinta, right? Yes. Yeah, I'd gotten a telex from Hubbard saying, I need some more messengers. Good job, Janice. Good job. You could have picked anybody else. You could have picked it. You could, hey. have picked, you could have picked a million different people, but you picked this guy. I know. I know. I know. He but actually failed on his first mission. He was, this yes. first, he was a missionary and he failed. I think that was his only mission that he yeah. did. It was a mission into the flag service org and they failed on it. And then he was doing investigations or programs execution for me. And then, yeah, then I got a message saying that he needed some messengers. So I, I took Dave, sent him. I took Shelly and sent her because she just hit 16 years old and didn't need to, go to, um, school, high school. Go to school anymore. Right. Yeah. That's so, the thing too, guys, just so you know, if anybody's watching, if you're in the Sea Org and you're like 12 or 13, you're supposed to go to school. And so there's sort of like this veiled attempt to sort of satisfy that by having them study, these kids study or go to actually attend a school if there's a school nearby. But then when you get to 16 in the United States, if you're if you're 16 or older, you don't legally have to attend school. You can drop out of school. And so if you're in the C organization and you hit 16, it's it's guaranteed that you will never, ever go to school ever again after that point. And they're just because right. now they're off the hook legally. And L. Ron Hubbard's like, you don't need that education. You need a Scientology education. So it's sort of agreed upon by the group that you don't need to go to school. So when Shelly was 16, um, she, that she was able to go because she didn't legally have to attend school anymore. Correct. Wow. Okay. And then, so when he went to, so when that, when Dave moved from Florida to Los Angeles to California, that is essentially when he started his ascent as a messenger well, and what? Yeah, no, not really. Okay. He, I sent him in January and then I ended up being called up there in April. Of what when year? I got there in 77, 1977. Okay. Yeah. When I got there in April, um, he was the traffic messenger. There was no LRH communicator, so all traffic had to be filtered before it went to Hubbard. So Dave was given that job. He was not a messenger on watch, helping Hubbard do things and running messages and that type of thing. He just dealt with the traffic. But he was a mess. He was part of the CMR. He was part of the Commodore's Messenger. Org. Yes, he was part of the Commodore's Messenger org. And yeah. I remember when I showed up, there was a messenger garden that had been cre created on the outside of the wall of rifle, and there was Dave, you know, showing me his radishes that he'd grown and <laughs> this type of thing. <laughs> it was just a, you know a young kid learning things. Yeah. And then, um, so then in. July 77, I think it was, when the FBI raided. Yeah. Dave Dave was not working with Hubbard as a messenger. He was still just filtering the, the traffic. Okay. The, the communications uh, that are coming in. Yes. Hubbard, right. That's what it's went in Scientology. That's called traffic. It just means uh, right. dispatches and communications. Not to be confused right. with cars, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Hubbard took off with Dee Dee and Gail and Pat. And went to Sparks. That left the rest of us. Yeah, that left the rest of us um, just Limbo. doing investigations. No, we we continued things he would have done, and you know, running things um, in Clearwater and uh, CMO in Los Angeles and so forth. We still continued that, and we had programs that we worked on executing and working to fix, continue fixing the property up. And then um, we also manned a telephone. 
So 24 hours, we manned this one telephone in case we got a call. And otherwise, we would go out and do go find a payphone and relay messages to Pat or go go to Los Angeles and meet Pat with a bag full of money and hand it over to him so that they had some money because Hubbard wanted to just operate on cash. Hmm. So we, we did things, you know, yeah. we kept, we kept busy, but we also got to, for our first time, have Liberty together. We could never have done that before, you know, and we'd go, we'd go do great things. We'd go tubing down the salt river or <laughs> something like that. Anyway, um, and meanwhile, Hubbard's now in Sparks, just living in a two-bedroom apartment with Gail, Dee Dee, and Pat living in one room and Hubbard in the other room. And, wow. you know, Dee Dee just cooking the food or Claire washing the clothes. No one was dusting every day and there was no complaints. Yeah. Wow. And no bodyguards and no special food flowing in or anything. So when do you think... So Dave, I want to say in the, then in the, in the mid eighties is when, when, when does Dave, cause I know he was in CMO in, he was at, was he the um, yeah. action chief? Action chief. He was yeah. Action chief. Well, he actually started running projects and missions while Hubbard was gone. Yeah. A and then Hubbard was, he's coming back. He was going to come back in January 78. So he wanted each messenger to train on a different area of CINE. Okay. So I, I got makeup, Dave got video camera with Mark Yeager, Terry got camera, you know, so we're all assigned to different things. And when Hubbard came back, Dave was the video camera man. Yes. He was video uh, IC. Video right. IC. Yes. And so he was on the set doing the, the videos and replaying those so Hubbard could read, look at what went on the film. Yeah. And then, then my sister and Jerry got in trouble and was sent to the RPF, so they needed a new cameraman. So Dave was put on cameraman at that point. Because he'd been this on a video the, camera before that, right. so it was sort of right. the natural progression yeah. is, okay, now you're going to work a film camera. Right. Now, when Hubbard got sick at the end of 78, he was no longer filming, so it was back to regular messenger duties for everybody. So Dave, at that point, was still a messenger in training. He was never a senior messenger, never yeah. in charge of a watcher handling things directly for LRH. He was like the third person called. Yeah. That's you know, what, we, that's what we were told at, at the base. for uh, Whenever somebody would ask, oh, did he used to be this? Is like, no, there's like very few references that talk about Dave, like Scientology policies right. or, in, or L, what they called at the base. Anything that L. Ron Hubbard wrote to the base in that, that 80s period or the late yep. 70s were called advices because yeah. mm -hmm. he supposedly wasn't running Scientology. So anything that he wrote was just advice to us, which we followed as if it was a an order from L. Ron Hubbard directly. Right. But right. um the only thing that we could find um, when we looked up Miscavige was he assigned um, uh, David Miscavige and Mark Yeager like a condition of confusion or liability for messing up a, a shot or something like that. On the videos, yeah. On the yeah, shooter, right. you know. <laughs> but Hubbard used to call Dave the kid. Yes. We, we had two Davids, David Rousseau and David Miscavige. And so yeah. it was DR and DM or Hubbard would always just say, where's the kid? Yeah. Wow. And nobody else was a kid. Just Dave was the kid. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So then after he's action chief, then how, and then he was, well, he wasn't, yet, he wasn't yet action chief. Oh, okay. Because then we moved to Hemet. Okay. And LRH is out at X. And, and, and yeah, and Dave is running mi missions at this point. Okay. He is. Yeah. But, Messengers would go out for a week to X and we'd stay there for a week and then go back to the base and do our, whatever our jobs were before. Well, Which this is like was about four LRH. miles away. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, but they didn't want the traffic heavy no, changeover of the traffic every day because the other people living in the apartments mo would notice right. something wrong. But you, as if these people wouldn't notice, 
this this redheaded man who's always yelling and screaming about something. And I'd be, oh my God, does he have to yell? These people are gonna hear, you know. Wow. But but anyway, that's we used to go out for a week at a time. And Dave was like too busy running missions and then they were setting up watchdog committees so he got himself on as the watchdog committee for sea org for the sea org orgs so he couldn't go out to x anymore and this was oh. just, this was just an excuse not to go out there yeah because he was too busy doing other things he obviously had a problem having to work directly with hubbard yeah you know yeah. so then hubbard took off well, the messengers, the, the messengers running management ended up in Los Angeles. Right. And then Hubbard took off and Dave was the action chief at that point. But he, it was his attitude where you try and point something out to him. He'd try and back you off and try. He's always trying to show how right he was about things. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah. Makes sense. That checks out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that remained true to right. today. <laughs> and then, and then, as the mission ops and action chief, he was assigned the job to fire missions to sort out the corporations. Yes, right. Because, because see, everything was under the Church of Scientology of California, so <laughs> that all had to be sorted out to start a Church of Scientology International and do break things up into different corporations so that everything wasn't in one basket to be sued. Yeah. Right. And so everything was moved out of the church of Scientology of California, making that a shell corporation and set up all the other corporations. And that was jo Dave's job as a mission ops. Okay. This all makes okay. sense now because that's really right. the thing that might've started the wheels turning. We well, yeah, right. plus also, he, well, also Janice, don't forget, Janice, don't forget, he also had to dismantle the Guardian's office at that same yeah, time. But I, as part well, of that's, yeah. that's, that's later. That's yeah. later because now he's, he's got this power of doing the corporation sort out, but that, that's okay. He wasn't interfering with anybody else. But LRH asked for a report. Um, no, LRH came back on the lines. And at this time, Dee Dee was the commanding officer and in charge, and she used to have to go and meet with Pat at nighttime. So she was like, Dave, will you come with me? So she wasn't the only female showing up in a bar to meet Pat, you know, and sitting there waiting for hours. So he was going along as an escort for Dee Dee. Hmm. And he'd already been buddy-buddy with Pat. Yeah. They'd been, they'd been roomies back at um, La Quinta. So... Didi then got tired of just sitting around listening to Pat having a lack of people to talk to. Pat would just ramble on for hours and Didi's worried about international stats and her, and her desk piling up. So she's like, Dave, why don't you just take the stuff to Pat? Cause they got along so well and would talk for hours. Yeah. So then what he happened? Became the go -between, between. He became that's, the go between. That's where the big mistake was made. Mm. Right, because then what happens is Dee Dee does an interview and she's talking to Omar um, Garrison. Omar Garrison. Omar Garrison. Who is working on who is working on LRH's biography, and she's just telling him everything. But she also, and she says that's why she was busted. And I say no. I remember she got busted because when LRH went off the lines, we had the buy now, where every end of the month the prices were going up 5%. Scientology prices. Scientology right. prices the because they, they hadn't been kept up with the economy for so long. We needed to do a catch up. So every end of the month, they were to go up 5%. The regs mm -hmm. loved it at the end of the month because they do a buy now and the public were like having a, you know, quickly before the rate, the, before the prices go up. So, Mary Sue had commented to Dee Dee because we were all kind of, what do we do? You know, should we cancel this? You know, it's, it's, it's getting too high and the public are getting upset about it. And Mary Sue said to Dee Dee, why don't you put a stop to it? And Dee Dee did. So Dee Dee ends up getting busted right around that same time. And I thought it was for doing that. Dee Dee thought it was for blabbing to Omar. Hmm. But anyway... Dave comes back 
having gone and met with Pat, with Gail, who was um, Dee Dee's deputy she, for internal. Yeah. And they come back with this order posting Gail as the commanding officer of the CMO and removing Dee Dee. And Dave is assigned special project ops only to report to Pat and LRH. So he had, through his connection with Pat, he had managed to separate himself out from the CMO. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so what, now what he year just was reported, this? This would have been. Um, 81. 81. 81, I think. 81. Yeah. yeah. So 81 to 86. Was the period yeah. that he was strategically negotiating. Well, he, yeah. you know, Janice is right. Yes. He was special project ops. That's what everybody knew him as then. Yeah. And then it then he became the, the chairman of the board of author services yeah. during that time period as part of the whole right. corporate sort out. But and he then was the one doing uh, the corporate sort out. So right. he, he was exactly. the one overseeing it all. He knew exactly which organization he wanted to be the head of at that time because that right. would give him the autonomy but also he still had that connection to L. Ron Hubbard. And he was also um, COB ASI, which was the one organization that was never going to be a nonprofit. It was always right. going to be a for-profit and it was always going to be swimming in cash. <laughs> right. And, and yet, right. You know, and Mark, what, what, like what Jana said, when he came back with that autonomy that he only reported to Pat or LRH, he then yeah. started flaunting it. You know what I mean? Like he could, he could well, remove the COCMO if he wanted to, and he could put his buddies in different positions. He acted like the, the cock of the walk. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what then actually happened was Gail is now the CO and she's seen the Dave getting a little too big headed mm -hmm. and she got a message to Pat. And to do that, you had to go to a pay phone call a beeper number and then wait for Pat to call you back. So Gail goes to John Brousseau and has John take her to the payphone. And I remember I come along and I'm like, I'm looking for Gail and I'm like, oh, she's gone. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I go in to see Dave and I see a hole in the wall. I'm like, how did that hole get in the wall? Oh, Dave was pissed off. I'm like, Dave did that? Yeah. And I'm like, Why? Well, he was mad at Gail, and he's gone off trying to find Gail. So Gail had gotten to the payphone to get the message to Pat. Dave finds out she's trying to get a hold of Pat, and obviously he knows it's going to be about him. And he knows so where the payphone he, is. <laughs> he yeah. knows where the payphone is. So he then gathers a couple of guys, and they go pile into, the, into a van, and off they go. Well, then at the payphone... They're trying to get pull Gail away and get her into a car. Meanwhile, Mark Yeager comes with a with a crowbar and he's bashing the payphone so it won't work. Breaking it. What? Well, the Gail, heck? Gail thought it was Dave who was doing it, but John Rousseau says he thought he it was Yeager doing it. Yeah. Anyway, it was this whole thing where they finally push Gail into a car and basically kidnap her from there and take her back to the base. Next thing you know, Gail's now busted and John Nelson is being put on. And John Nelson was a mission ops under Dave as the action. David, yeah. Mm, they yeah. were, they were so tight. Those two. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where Dave had control of that. Wow. Yep. And it, it was this whole phone booth. Yes. That's crazy. Okay. So then when, and then when um, Vicky, um, as Naran, she's the she's COB or the head of RTC. What did they call that? What did the they inspector call Inspector General? Was, yeah, inspector it was General. actually Steve Marlowe. We're, yeah. we're jumping around. It's actually, yeah, Steve it was Marlo. Steve Marlowe first. Vicky was yeah. his deputy, yeah, yeah. But then when <laughs> she left, when she left the um C, C org and left RTC, then that's when Dave moved from COB RT, uh, ASI, ASI to then COB RTC. Right. Yeah. This is after LRH and, died and, that, and they had to get rid of Pat and Annie and Vicky and Jesse were all allied with Pat and Annie. So they basically all yeah. got kicked yeah. out. Well, and, what, uh, what happened in there is Pat and DM were kind of working together and Vicky and Annie worked together. Yeah. And Mark, Mark Yeager was the CO and I was 
KK was the chief officer and I was the operations chief. So I was running all the operations. And there was, RTC had come along and had insisted that no one was fully had it anymore. Therefore, you can't get any more bonuses unless you've had the FPRD, the false purpose rundown. And if you've had the false purpose rundown, then you can be considered fully had it. So that basically stripped everybody of being able to have bonuses and different perks. So I, a few months later, you know, the, the income, the international income is going down and delivery is going down and so forth. And I go to Jaeger and I say, the date coincidence on this is when RTC implemented taking away people's fully had it status and our bonuses. And then what happens is Vicky and Annie are teaming up and wanting to take out Jaeger. And DM and Pat come along and they're like trying to investigate what the hell's going on. And it comes up that Jaeger supported me on saying RTC were the cause of the crash in international stats for implementing the false purpose rundown on us all and taking away our bonuses. And Pat and DM are like, yeah, this is totally correct. And that's when they were like, Vicky was going after Jaeger. And that's when it was like, wait a minute, something's going on here. Why is she still doing this? Yeah. And so then they took out Vicky and Jesse and Spike did a whole and all the, with yeah, that. the whole the whole right. ball that was uh right that was yeah and, 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 it's, and there's tell actually you. more involved than that it's more involved well than yeah that. no i know but we're not we, yeah i wasn't trying yeah. to make this a video about david miscavige how he <laughs> no, took it over but i mean it's kind of probably no one's ever really told it in any great amount of detail right. but regardless the the way it worked in religious technology is there uh, it's the religious technology center is there was the inspector general and then below the inspector general was ethics, tech, and admin. And right. there was no COB RTC. That didn't exist. No, I, I did the no. org board, Mark. I'm the yeah. one who did the org board and the stats. Yeah. That, you know, Miscavige told I was working for him as the corporate liaison in charge. And he yeah. took over RTC and he had this idea. He had already pulled up Jaeger and Midoff and Marty to be there. And he wanted them to be his deputies. And he wanted Greg Wilhair to be the inspector general. And yeah. then he wanted to be the chairman of the board of RTC, which never existed. Yeah. So I did the whole ethics, tech, and admin org board, including all the divisions of the org. I I had to do that, the statistics, the valuable final products, the whole bit. And yeah. so I'm the one who, who wrote all that up based on what he wanted done. Yeah. But I, was, I was redoing all yeah. that in 2004, Mark. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Small but, world. But essentially, he had already held this title in another organization. And and, in knew, author services. Yeah. And he knew that he was untouchable in that position. So he just created that position in a higher, more powerful organization within the Scientology structure. And this is the other thing that is is kind of crazy is that he had been picking his team at all points of this this track of this this timeline is he were, was putting his boys and his mm -hmm. club in the places where he needed them so that when he was going to do something, he'd be like, hey, you got my back. And then those guys. And the, the wildest thing is today, those are all the people that are in the hole are all his. Right. right. And, <laughs> and the, while he was putting those people in position, he was getting rid of anyone who had been connected to Hubbard. Yes. Right. He, you know. Because they was, knew Hubbard did, wouldn't do those it, things. Exactly. So they knew he took that, that he'd, he'd get kickback from them. Right. Because I was even taken out at that time. And I was that's when the running program came about because they were trying to offload and declare me. And then Hubbard was like, have her get out and run as a, a solution to handling my disaffection with everything going on. Yeah, but the other thing I want to say is that he was also controlling up until L. Ron Hubbard's death. He was controlling the information flow to Pat. Yes. Right. And then yes. right. and therefore to L. Ron Hubbard. So he could right. spike the deck any way he wanted. If there was a bad report that would that would out him, he could just remove that from the pack. Which and, correct. Which and that's he did. what he did with Gail. But when he came and blow up the phone, that was yeah. that's right. a but, perfect example of that. 
Yes, but he also, when LRH ordered him sec checked, he ordered Pat David and Dave, David uh, Miscavige and Pat were both ordered to sec checks. Mayo did um, Pat's and Jesse Prince did Dave's. David and Mayo. Those, yeah. The reports on those sec checks never got to Hubbard because they were put in the box to go up to Hubbard and Dave and Pat removed them from the box. Wow. Right. And some so, of their crimes uh, were some of the crimes were taking some of the cash that they had from was. L. Ron Hubbard and gambling, <laughs> gambling it away in Las Vegas and hooking up with prostitutes and all sorts of stuff. And of course, that no. stuff never made it to Hubbard. <laughs> well, also, also the bad investment into the oil wells with Hubbard's right. money. Yes. That would have that would have come up as well. Yeah, and Hubbard wow. never knew that all that money was it was, was like thirty blown. million dollars. Thirty million lost. dollars on yeah. oil wells that those was lost. Wow. Yeah, but Mark, okay. you make a good point. He put his he put his allies, quote unquote, in key positions of power. The other aspect of it, though, was because he was overseeing the corporate sort out and the different corporations. He had the attorneys all on his side too. He hired and fired the attorneys and the attorneys would, would basically set up all the corporations and paperwork to protect him as well. Yeah. So he had it, he had it all worked out, you know, and then, and then he basically towed the line in my opinion, because we left in 1990 because until the IRS tax exemption, because that was priority number one after Hubbard died, because all the money that that Hubbard left was supposed to go into, you know, I'm not, well, it's supposed to go to church, science, spiritual technology, but basically Scientology. But that couldn't happen until they got tax exemption. So he yeah. had to play ball all the way up to that point. And then at the, after that, that's when he started, you know, going nuts and spending all this money and all that sort of stuff, you know. <clears throat> yeah. And and the other thing was that um, he had spent years uh, trying to get this all clear for Hubbard. And yes. as part of the and that's really what a lot of the corporate sort out was uh, was revolving around. But he had spent years with the lawyers and the corporate sort out people trying to figure out how L. Ron Hubbard could be could have um, inurement happening where he could profit from Scientology and it wouldn't, it wouldn't blow back on Hubbard. So he was the perfect person to figure out how to do that for himself because he had been working on it for Hubbard for years and years right. and years. Yeah. So once he got himself into the right position, he already knew most of the ways that was, that this was going to work out to benefit him after Hubbard died. And I think this is a perfect kind of segue into, okay, let's talk about, let's talk about Dave and his, it, and how he ran the joint and what, he, how he lived. Um, when he was first in RTC um, and you guys were there um, at that time, the base, the international headquarters was where he was living. Right. When he became COB RTC. Right. Yeah, he moved right. up. He had been in yeah, Los Angeles, up. but he, he moved yeah. up and spent more time at the base. Okay, good. And he, I can cover his I can cover his facilities because I was perfect. in charge of them basically. Perfect. He he had a, he always had a room, even when he was in Los Angeles and also when he was special project ops in the lower villa. That bedroom that mm -hmm. was right next to what later became the officer's lounge was his and Shelley's bedroom. And that's what he had. And then that what, you know, the uh, you'll know the, the officer's lounge part I'm talking about, Mark. It wasn't the officer's lounge until Pat and Annie were kicked out. That was Pat and Annie's birthing, the, oh. what, what later became the officer's lounge. Nice. So they had that big part. DM was right next door. So as soon as she took over in RTC, that, yeah. that room got nuked. And that became the officer's lounge, which was basically just a lounge for David Miscavige yeah. and whoever he wanted to come in there because there were no other officers allowed in there unless he was allowed in there. Yes. So he had his bedroom and he had that officer's lounge. We had an office in the middle villa and I my office was next door with a connecting door. And those were his facilities. He had a car that was provided for by um, RTC or if, you know whatever, it was an Acura, it was just a regular sedan. And uh, and then he had, a, uh, he had a Honda Passport motor scooter. It was light blue and white. And he and Shelly would be, you know, tooling around the property on that. Hmm. And that's all he had 
when he was work when I was there. Yeah. Now, right when I was getting busted, they were busting through a wall into another room next to their bedroom to make like a clothing room or whatever for him. But uh, that was what he had. Now he had high end stereo. You know, you know that Mark. He had yeah. clothes. He collected cowboy boots. He got, you know, he started getting tailor made clothes and all that sort of stuff. But well, yeah, now I'm going to tell have, you. Now I wanted yeah. that I wanted to let Claire tell us because Claire, when she was in Religious Technology Center, she was the internal executive. So she was over all the internal R RTC divisions that serviced him and bought his personal stuff and 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 fed him and and all that stuff. And so, um, and also she was aware of these bonuses that were being. Oh paid out. no, so, that started yeah. when he came over from yeah. ASI. I was yeah. involved yeah. in that. Well, let's hear yeah. about that, Claire. <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> well, so from um, 96 to 2004 is the years that I was in Religious Technology Center. And Barbara Griffin was over the finance area. Yep. Um, by that point, though, um, just RTC had hit 30 million in reserves, um, like just that, you know, small organization. Um, and Barbara Griffin was researching how to um, get Dave's salary to be equivalent to other uh, similar positions. Um, and like yeah, they religious would, leaders. Outside yeah, exactly. Science, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, nothing to do with SO pay. He was on his own system, uh, which yeah which was carefully hidden from everybody. Um, but Barbara Griffin was the one who administered all of that behind the scenes. And then, um, and how much yeah. Do you think he was being paid uh, a year in terms of a salary? Was it, it was like 300,000 or something. Yep. Yep. About that. And, and well, also separate to that, the bonuses were structured so that um, Dave was number one, Larice was number two and Shelly was number three. And that was specifically structured, even though Shelly was, senior and higher than Larice so that you wouldn't have Mr. And Mrs. getting paid the most. Right. right. It used to be the other way. It used to be the other way. It was Dave and Shelley yeah. at the top of the RTC bonus. But yeah. But before RTC, they were at Shelley and Dave were at ASI and they were getting high pay then right. because ASI was a was a nonprofit. So they no no they were for profit. They were profit. For profit. They were full profit. Yeah. So they had to be paid equivalent of and then apparently they had to pay for their rent and stuff like that. But they got a much yeah. higher pay, no longer sealed pay. So Dave but was could, used I to that when he that. came up to RTC. Right. Because when he came to RTC and I did the org board, I did the bonus system too, because Dave had to be paid the same as he got paid at author services. There was not, he was not taking a pay cut. Okay. Right. So yeah. that's why all the RTC executives in those days, like me and several others, that's why we were getting bonuses like $1,500, $2,000. We get an end of the year bonus of three or $4,000. And that's why when people go, I know like Mark, you were in gold and all that, you guys barely got paid anything, right? Well, people are like, well, what about you? I yeah. had lots of money because, shoot, my wife and I saved up to $26,000 just off of Sea Org bonuses when I was wow. in RTC. Why? Because Dave Miscavige and Shelly needed to be paid. Okay. Wow. And Barbara Griffin was responsible for making sure bonuses got paid. Hmm. That's so wild. Well, you know, so during, the, during the years, years, yeah, the no, during the years that I was there, but, but during the years that they were doing the bonuses, it was just Dave and Shelly and his staff, oh, not, wow. the, well, then that, not the yeah, RTC so, executives anymore. That's exactly what I was going to yeah. say. Right. It got to the point where even though Claire was in RTC and they were getting bonuses, it wasn't anything like the heyday that's crazy. Of, of the the main executives of RTC. Well, and see, that's Miss Gavin putting on a show. <laughs> he was putting on a show because he didn't look. He was still afraid when he came and became COB RTC that he didn't trust all the executives that were uh, up at CMO Int and, and ED Int and this and that. So he was playing by the rules. Like he flew first class, but he didn't take private jets. That would have been considered a financial irregularity. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. And, you know, like I used to have to go down to see Mark Ingber or Tom Ashworth, um, to, who were the WDC reserves, to get these huge expenses approved. And they'd look at me kind of funny. And I, I kind of felt the same way, you know, but basically that was frowned upon in the Sea Org. We didn't spend 
money on huge cars and things like that. It just that that was not what it was for. Yeah. When we were in Golden Air Productions, I got my it's funny that you mentioned that figure, 26,000 that you had saved up between you and Julie. Um, mm -hmm. When I was. was me. Yeah. Well, when <laughs> I was sure. in the sorry, Sea Org, but yeah, <laughs> I was in the Sea Org from I joined at Able, but at Gold from 1990 to 2005, my Social Security statement says that I earned a total of $26,000 for the entire 15 years that I was in the sea wow. organization. And yeah. that averages, if you just, just take the sheer amount of hours we worked, not the, not the all nighters, not the craziness, just the hours it's 36 cents an hour. That's how much we, that's how much I was paid for working in the sea Org for 15 years. I was paid 36 cents an hour. So to hear that, you know, David Miscavige is, is getting a $300,000 a year, salary as a Sea Org member. And now this is the reason I wanted to talk about this stuff is because this is what Scientologists are interested in. People that are wondering if they're in Scientology and if David Miscavige is a con man or a cult leader or he's being uh, treated differently than other Sea Org members, this is how it's working. This is what's happening behind the scenes that he's not telling anybody about. And this, and, and in most cases, I would say 99% of Sea Org members don't know that he's making several hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. And at Correct. the same time, it, you, it, if somebody outside of Scientology or outside of the Sea Org goes, well, I mean, who cares? He is the leader of Scientology. Um, $300,000 is not that much. But then you go, okay, that's fair. It's probably a, a hell of a lot more these days because uh, 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 we've been gone for, you know, a decade or more. But then also he doesn't have any expenses. He doesn't pay for anything at all. And right. this is how I want to segue to the next thing, which is the things that David Miscavige had. We heard about the stuff that L. Ron Hubbard had. David Miscavige, when I was there for the 15 years I was there, I went and worked on many of his audiovisual systems all over the world. And at the international headquarters, he had multiple places where he had these very, very expensive setups that in any one setup could be just as a, like when I say setup, I mean like an audio visual system, like he had a lounge in the dining area. You, you might've heard us mention this place called MCI that's Massacre Canyon Inn. And that is the dining hall that all of the Sea Org members at the Ant base would go to eat at in the middle of the property each day in that building. He had what was called, it wasn't the officer's lounge. What was it called? It was called the billiards. Uh, room. Yeah. Billiards it was room. Called that's the right. Billiards room. You're muted. Oh, that was a crew lounge. It used to be a crew lounge, but yeah, then it was crew lounge and it was a game room, whatever yeah, it was. It, yeah. it had a yeah. giant pool table in the middle of it. It yep. had a stereo system. It had satellite TV. It had a Nintendo 64 oh, game wow. system in it. It had all this stuff. But again, the only person that was really allowed to use that was David Miscavige. There was no one else that was allowed to just go in there and monkey with stuff. And even if he was going to watch a Philly, uh, he was uh, from Philadelphia. <clears throat> and if he was going to watch a football game, um, we would have to go around to all these sort of setups that he had all over the base and make sure that the satellite, it was in the days where you had to, when you push the channel, the satellite would move and it would adjust itself to point at the satellite that that game was going to be on. And so we'd have to go around the property and we'd have to make sure that all the satellites were tuned to the right station so he could watch his football games whenever that was going to be. But then um, that system could be a fifty dollars to $100,000 system, just that one. Well, he had four or five of those on the property at the end base, but then he also had one of those in UK. He had one of those in Los Angeles at ASI at Author Services where he stayed. He had one of those in Clearwater. He had one of those at Clearwater at the WB building where the CMO and RTC were located. But he also had one of those systems at the Hacienda Apartments where he had a full apartment. So, and then when, when he was going down to Los Angeles more and working with Tom Cruise and doing lots of stuff in Hollywood, there was a, an apartment building next 
to ASI, right directly adjacent to ASI. And it was called El Cadiz. He bought that entire apartment building. And so he could have his own private apartment and he could have offices there. And then they built a tunnel so that he could walk from ASI to El Cadiz. So he was getting all of that stuff and none of that was coming out of his pocket. That was just things that were being provided for him. So yeah. what what are some of the other things, Claire? Yeah, so the private jets and all the that uh, being the primary um, mode of transportation started right after 9-11 um, because obviously September 11th was right before the IAS event, which was... Um, which is and always has been the cash cow of events where they rake in millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point, that's when the transport changed to private jet as sole form of transportation. That's also when the bulletproof van was being built and, um, and then the private apartments at, in, in each continent um, for Dave. And, you know, there's the concept within the C organization of being Fabian, meaning you can move around being undetected. Uh, David Miscavige was all about that. And that's where this strategy started of spending millions of dollars on his apartments in every single continent and location so that nobody would ever know where he is. And, you know, that's playing out today with process servers and so forth. What were you going right. to say, Janice? Yeah, I was just going to say on the bulletproof van, that was something Pat Broker got into trying to get all LRH's cars bulletproofed. And Pat was like into this whole spy and espionage type of stuff that I personally, having known Hubbard for the 11 years I worked with him directly, I think that was all Pat. Hmm. I don't think Hubbard was into that himself. Interesting. David Miscavige, absolutely. Like I said, is hands down one of the most paranoid people I've ever met. Yes. Oh, I mean, the, my fir very first introduction, um, like the day that I, or within a week of arriving into Religious Technology Center was uh, spending like eight hours in a conference room with 20 top RTC executives. And it was just David Miscavige coming in and out, berating them about how they, um, Bob Champagne, who had been in Religious Technology Center, had been spying on David Miscavige's emails, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my God, he was so mad. Uh, he had access to know. the computer system and he was reading through David Miscavige's files. <laughs> yeah. As, um, as was happening too with uh, the, the guy from Incom, the computer, the head of yeah. the computer organization had yeah. also been um doing snooping the in his files yeah yeah because they had a uh, um scientology had loosely had their own computer network that via fiber and um and microwave transmission and receivers on all the different properties would send messages to each other and then after dave's stuff kept getting snooped in they just switched over to like you know encrypted regular email in the in the real world but the other thing i wanted to say was that um, we talked about some of L. Ron Hubbard's houses in different places and the houses that he still had, um, Dave wouldn't even stay in those houses because he considered them um, like shit. So mm -hmm. he never stayed in the in the Bonnie View house at the property because oh, it no. wasn't something he even cared about. But at a certain point in the mid 90s, they ended up building they ended up uh, bulldozing the house that l ron hubbard did have which is kind of weird because all of the other houses that he stayed in it no matter where in his life in africa or in uh, new jersey or scientology ended up buying up a lot of those houses and They're making right them and, and and renovating them but the house that was his at the international headquarters they just bulldozed it and built him a whole new house that he never yeah. ever even stayed in but in the end you find out oh it's because the, that house had an amazing guest house and a pool house and all these other amenities, a theater that David Miscavige used as his own after oh. L. Ron Hubbard had been dead for right. 21 years. And it was sure that he was never coming back because in 2007 was the date when he, Hubbard was supposed to show back up. 
like, hey, I'm done with my leave and I'm here. And that is the house where they were, this new mansion that was at the property was the house. And this was in, when I was still there in 2004, when I went through out this new house that they is now, it was still called BV, Bonnie View or Beautiful View. But now it was a giant multi, multi-million dollar mansion that right. was built for L. Ron Hubbard. Right. And when right. I was toured through that house by Annie Tidman or broker, whatever you want to call her, Annie, um, they were setting his clothes out for the next day. When I was in that house, they were setting his clothes out. And these are the clothes that when he was from the seventies, when he was still wearing these, he was a, not a small dude. He was a big dude. And so they were setting his clothes out on there and they were telling me like every season in this house, they changed the entire decor of the house. So yes. in the fall, that's so ridiculous. In the, fall, the drapes, the bedding, the pillows, the couch, all the fabrics, all of the tapestries are fall tapestries. And when we move into the next season, they have a storage building and they pull out the next season's things and they redecorate the entire house for the new season. And if you look at, there's drone footages and stuff of the property, but there are buildings that are just storage buildings for all of these things that they're going to swap out in the house. This is for a house that no one lives in. Lives in. There's nobody living there. There's nothing happening. And they're doing all this work just in case this dude rolls in and's like, hey, I'm here. Oh, wait a minute. You, it's March. You have the winter or you have the summer decor up. What's and also, going on? Also, you know, I've lost a little weight. I don't think those clothes are really going to fit well, me now. That's what I would always tell people. I was like, how's a 21-year-old L. Ron Hubbard going to fit in a 72-year-old L. Ron Hubbard's clothes? <laughs> well, the interesting thing on that is when Hubbard passed away, he'd actually been on an apple juice diet for a long time. Yeah. And so he was a scrawny little old man. He was really? no longer that big size. Yeah, that's what Annie had told me. Oh, I didn't know this. Yes. Wow. So all those clothes wouldn't have fitted him anyway. He would have <laughs> had a whole new wardrobe. Right. You know. But that's but, the thing. That... But even so, <laughs> and changing things per the season, you know, on the ship, we had the same red velvet curtains in his office for eight years. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and the same as his cabin or even other locations, that stuff never changed. The furniture never changed. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah. And I'm just going to put this up here because this is from somebody who was in CST. I'm, I want to say blow drill. I want to yeah. say this is um, Dylan. Dylan, hey, right? Dylan. Dylan. Yeah. Dylan, yeah. yeah Thanks for joining us. He said household unit needed to keep their stats <laughs> up somehow. Makes sense. Yeah. Yes. So the, the, there's a part of the CMO, the Commodore's messenger organization at the international headquarters. There is a CMO organization that's just for that property. It's not for, it doesn't manage or do anything. It's called CMO gold. And it was the CMO for golden era productions, but within CMO golden era productions, there was what was called a household unit. And those were the people that were assigned to work in that house. And I mean, these people are, if you were a lawnmower for the household unit, you had the same lawnmower as the lawnmower guy that was in gold, but you only mowed the lawns that were on Hubbard's house or adjacent properties. So was you would literally be mowing a lawn there, here. Right? And on the other side of the road, somebody else would have to mow that lawn because they're not in the CMO and they're in Golden Air Production. It was like, this is the most inefficient setup I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Mark, was Paco still there? Paco yes. Suarez? Yeah, and he Paco. was El Rachel Steward. Yeah. And Paco would tell stories. He was still in the household unit and he was still at the house. And he, it's funny that you say Paco. Paco was the one laying out the clothes. And yeah. Paco would tell stories about how he would get L. Ron Hubbard dressed. And I was like, what? He goes, he would lay his clothes out for him and run a bath and he would help L. Ron Hubbard put his clothes on. And I'm going like, no. I'm like, what? 
And I'm thinking to myself, this is the most insane thing I've ever heard. But even when Paco was setting his clothes out at that time, it just was such an odd thing to me that I never knew the whole time I was at the base. I only found out about this in 2004. And I'm thinking to myself, why would they be laying out the clothes? It was just one of those things that I could never wrap my head around. Like it just, it made no sense. And also pour the bath, pouring a bath. Like you, the dude can't turn a faucet and like start the bath for himself. Like, what are we talking about here? But, but, but in terms of other stuff that Dave had, he also had vehicles galore. Claire talked about the van, by the way, the van had the, the license plate of this bulletproof GMC. I think it was like a GMC Savannah that was just completely stripped and they put lead in it and they made bulletproof windows. They had, um, multi uh like i don't know what you call it laminated windows so bullet couldn't go through it yeah but um the license plate of that van was d d f w m and i saw it the first day it rolled into the property it went into motor pool and it said the license plate and i went i kind of went like oh are you kidding me and then yvonne who was the she used to be in religious technology center until she tried to yvonne escape Gonzalez. yeah and then she became yeah. a motor pool i see she was in charge of fixing motorcycles and cars at the base and she and john brousseau were the one who had built this van uh custom made this van for david miscavige as soon as it yeah. rolled in i looked at the license plate and i was like oh gosh and she goes, you know what that means? And I was like, yeah, it says don't F with me. And she goes, how did you guess? And I was like, that seems just like something Dave would put on his license plate. Don't F with me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but he had a Range Rover, like a brand new Range Rover. He had a Mazda Miata. He had a, he had multiple motorcycles. He had a TW 200. He had a TW 200 that was super, super modified by JB. He had a Harley Davidson motorcycle. He had, um, what other cars? He had a B, um, at least one or two different BMWs. I think he had an eight series. He had a seven series. He had, yeah, uh, he, he had a BMW given to him by ASI for Christmas one year. It was super high end. I don't remember which model it was, but it was an eight series. Yeah. But the, the organization paid for it and gave it to him, which was then a huge flap because the because of the inurement element that was documented mm -hmm. because of where the money came from so barbara Ru ruiz who was the head of asi at the time got in massive amounts of trouble for that and it was then reverse engineered so the staff were all given a bonus that divided out into the amount of the purchase price of the car and then you know Donated. they they paid for that yeah, instead the of the organization, staff. the staff of the organization paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> Real briefly, Mark, I got to tell you that Mazda Miata, how he got that car was when I worked for him, you know, he we got a new car every year uh, to click corporate liaison office and DM. And DM had like an Acura sedan, right? Anyway, I bought personally with some of the money that I got paid a Honda CRX in 1980. Uh, it was a 1986 Honda CRX. I bought it in 1988. It was a used car, right? But it was hot. It was fast. You know, it was a little pocket rocket, five speed, you know, that type of thing. And he hated that I had this car because, uh, you know, it was pretty fast. We When we went to the movies, you know, on RTC would go to the movies after staff meeting on Friday night. I would drive that. He didn't like it. Anyway, so he bought the Mazda Miata, which was this little red car. And I couldn't literally get into it. Yeah. It was so small. It's a Barbie and Ken doll movie. It should have been in the Barbie movie. That's how <laughs> small this Miata was. I was going to say, he, it's a chick car. Had. Okay, it's a chick car. There's no way around it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway but hubbard but hubbard didn't have half the vehicle fleet that david miscavige has no. and also the other thing i wanted to say in terms of the food was that the entire time that i was there um dave was very fond of sushi and he would on a regular basis at least once a week they would have sushi that was driven from Santa Monica on the, on the coast of Los Angeles that was driven to the property. And that's what he'd have for lunch or that's what he'd have for dinner or whatever, because we would see it in the fridge. And even if it was there, didn't mean he ate it. It just means it was there in case he did. And right. so we would have, 
Did he What's eat with that? the staff? No. Did he eat with the staff in, in the, the dining room? Early, in the very early he did 90s. when he was with us. Yeah. In the yeah. very early 90s, there was um, in MCI, there was the crew side and there was the officer side. And on the officer side, they had these really nice bay windows that overlooked the grass areas and all the lawns and all that. It was just a nice view. And he his table was in the center of those three tables on the officer side. And that's where RTC executives sat and CMO international CMO uh, executives sat. And for the first few years I was there, he would he wouldn't eat every meal, but he would at least eat there a few times a week. You'd see him in there because when he showed up, it was everybody was on a, a just a slightly different behavior than if he wasn't there <laughs> eating. You know what I'm saying? Like there was a foosball yeah. table on the officer side in the in the sort of lounge area by the coffee bar or whatever that was. And. So if Dave was there, you didn't dare play foosball during lunchtime. But if Dave wasn't there, people would be playing foosball or just sleeping in the chairs in the lounge to sleeping during a meal to take like get some sleep because they'd been there all night or whatever. But um, but he also had his personal staff, I would say, was about 15 people the entire time I was there. He had at least 15 people that were the all they the only people they did anything for was David Miscavige between his communicator his assistant he had different communicators for different types of things so he had cob communicator for compliance which that person just went around and chased up orders that he had been given that he had given people and were they done with them he had another um, person which was cob communicator for traffic and that was just the person that would oversee the communications that were coming in from coming in from he had he, he had one for incoming one for out like one person for incoming one person for outgoing then he had his secretary then he had um transcripts uh, people that would just transcribe his yes his, exactly whenever he would go somewhere larice who was cob communicator she would have a tape recorder. And if she wasn't there, then Shelly would have a tape recorder. And yes. as soon as that meeting was over, they would literally pop the tape out and give it to somebody and pop a new tape in for the next meeting. And someone would, that tape would be rushed up to, to RTC <clears throat> and they would start transcribing it. So by the time he went to the next meeting or a meeting after the next meeting, there were already transcripts being printed and sent to your area of all the things that he talked about two hours ago when he was right. there. I'm so glad wow. I left when I did. Oh, I'm so glad I left when I did. When I was there, it was me and one other person. And then there was a girl, Jackie, who was in the office. And then one person who handled their laundry and whatever other fair. So it was four of us to handle yeah. DM and Shelly's, whatever they needed. That was it. And my job, obviously, I was into the organization doing stuff, not just dealing with his stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Go ahead. We did. We did record when Hubbard would talk to people. We'd have a recorder going on that. But it, it was it was then just, you know, put in a file cabinet with all the others, but it was never transcribed and anything like that. Oh, these were these and some of these meetings, that would be the other thing. Sometimes we would go to a meeting and when once the um L. Ron Hubbard mansion was completed, then was it building 50 was done after the um bv right or kind of yep. around the same time it, but it, no, finished it was after, after. yeah B building after, 50 was definitely after so he had built a, a building as if rtc was hundreds of people rtc was tens of people it was never hundreds of people i think at the most rtc had what 30 40 people claire um no it had been up to yeah 50 but but you're okay. right but the 50. the building was definitely designed to have like 200 staff in it exactly comfortably so this, <laughs> this building he had built was called building 50 it just happened to be the 50th building on that property that was built and the, that's what we call it building 50 um this building was i think it i think it was it ended up costing like 30 million plus in the end with all the redos and everything like that but we would go up to a meeting 
at this building and we would sit in the courtyard and he had ha set the courtyard up as a giant conference room. It could fit, the courtyard could fit 200 people just in that one place. And he would have tables set up in a big giant U. And then we'd go up there for, for a meeting. Sometimes we would wait, like we're talking about 30, 40 executives from all over the property. We would sit up there and wait for two hours, just sitting at tables. And it would just be like, yeah, there's nobody to, there's nobody to say like, Hey, is he coming? That would, you're not, you're not going to say that you just wait. And then when he would come, he would yell at us for how we hadn't gotten anything done all day. And how, when he had met with us yesterday and nothing was done and we'd be like, dude, we've been waiting here for you the whole day. How are we going to go and do stuff if we're right. sitting here <laughs> waiting for you? And yesterday we were in, we were in other meetings with you on other stuff that has nothing to do with this stuff. And that's why we didn't do any of that stuff either. And that meeting. So no one would say that out loud. Oh yeah, you'd never say that. Right. But that's what's going on. That's the thought bubble. Like what? But we, so let's say we got there at one o'clock for the meeting and he showed up at three. That meeting could go to nine o'clock that night. And we would sit there and listen to him yell at us for three or four hours or however long it was. And then he'd give us, you know, a week's worth of work to have done by tomorrow. And then by the time you got back to your workspace after that meeting, he was already in another space. And if you happen to also have something to do with that space, then you were right back into another meeting with him for the rest of the night. And you couldn't even have relayed the things that you needed done from the last meeting that you were at. You Like you have to tell all your people, okay, we got to do this and we got to do that. We got to change this. Don't do this anymore. Dave doesn't like that. You got to do it this way. We got to do it this way. You couldn't even do that before you'd have to be up, end up in another He's meeting. psychotic. He, he, he yeah. was, you know, we could see it at the time. I mean, he used to do that, but not to that extreme. He always would bypass, but you know, one of the Hubbard policies was you don't bypass the senior of an area and go directly order his juniors to do things because you just cross order everything. And, and he would do it on a daily basis, yeah. you know? And he would, yeah. And he would also invariably he would contradict something that he had told us to do at another time. Right. So when you would, you would have to, he would say, you got to do this or you got to do that. Um, I'm going to just add Claire back in here. She added herself, but uh, there it is. Um, so he would say like, paint this black. And then there'd be a transcript about all this other stuff. And in there it'd say, oh, you got to make sure you paint it black. And then he'd be in another meeting and he'd go, you know what? I know you guys were going to paint that thing white. I think you should uh, paint it blue. And you're like, well, you told us to paint it black. And then you'd be like, well, now we're totally screwed because now we have something saying to paint it black and we have something to say to paint it blue. And he thinks that we were going to paint it white. We never talked about white. He's the only person who's ever said white. And so then when you're answering him, he has this army of people that are comparing your answer to everything he's wrote. And he says, well, right here, he said, that you guys were supposed to paint it black. Did you ever paint it black? And we're like, well, no, because but we couldn't even get the paint. By the time we got the, the black paint, he said to paint it blue. And so then you're like, well, now I got to get a PO or finances approved to do blue. And you're like, no, he said in here, you're supposed to do black. Why are you painting it blue? It's like, well, he said here to paint it blue. And you're like, well, which one is it? He'd be like, oh my God. And this is the kind of, when you, when you we're doing this series on my channel called The Spy Files, and we did a bunch of spy files that had to do with Scientology and OSA trying to mess with us. And now we're doing all these ones where they're talking about Tom Cruise. But you see people are writing back and they're arguing over this. And he's saying, I told you to do this and you didn't do it. And the amount of time that's wasted and spent on Dave talking and people talking to Dave and him yelling at them for not doing that's thousands and thousands of Sea Org hours a week are just right. dedicated to, to, to dealing with interfacing with David Miscavige. And that's the thing to me where if Scientologists knew this, their money, the, when they give Scientology a thousand dollars, about 500 of that's going to Dave. And the other 500 is spit is split through the rest of Scientology. And if they realize that Dave himself 
is spending millions and millions and millions of dollars and also wasting millions and millions of dollars, yeah. then maybe they wouldn't give they wouldn't give Scientology that money because it's not being spent to help anyone really at the end of the day. It's right. it's it's just going to support David Miscavige. He's the only Sea yeah. Org member who lives better than a president of a country. You know what I'm yes. saying? Right. And Sea Org members, most Sea Org members don't know this. Certainly most Scientologists don't know this. And um, and I think the only people that would even have an inkling of it is people that aren't in Scientology because they know that's how the world works. The guy who's the boss is the one making all the money. When you're right. in the Sea Org, you just think all Sea Org members are built the same and are yeah. treated the same and there's no big deal. And when you're in David Miscavige's sphere, your sphere, you're like, no, no, this dude has unlimited funds for whatever he wants. Like when you see, when he's like, oh, I was snowmobiling with Tom Cruise in Alaska last week, you know, you're not the same as David Miscavige. Right. Okay? <laughs> don't, don't forget the swimming with turtles and, you know, the, yeah, all that exactly. stuff. But, but yeah. also too, let's not forget the parallel in relation to Hubbard and David Miscavige vanishing their wives. Yes. Yeah, that's true. He yes. did do the yes. same thing. Yes. When, even when Janice was talking about the separate bedrooms, I was like, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. Claire and I were on different schedules too, Janice, but we didn't have separate bedrooms. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> we we just yeah. were lucky to ever be in the bedroom at the same time for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but, I wasn't waking her up and she wasn't waking me up because we weren't ever sleeping. No. <laughs> we weren't ever at our house. <laughs> right, right. But speaking of banishing... When Hubbard was in Sparks, Mary Sue was still at uh, La Quinta, and she was actually in charge running the base. And I'll tell you, it was wonderful. We mm. had sane schedules. We had time off. You know, it, it was great. There was the, pr the stress and pressure wasn't there. Mm. And wow. then yeah. Hubbard wanted to come back, and he would not come back while Mary Sue was there because he felt she was yeah. a danger. Mm. So she had to be set up in Los Angeles with her own place, which he apparently bought for her and, and moved before he would even return to La Quinta. Wow. So what year was Mary Sue moved to the house? And it was in Los Feliz, right? Yeah. Well, he returned January 5th, 1978. So it was the end of 77 that she was being moved down there. Wow. Wow. And so 77 until yeah. when she passed away. It, he did see her a few times in between because she would come up to the gold base and meet him up yeah, at we Bonnie View. Of it. Hmm. Yeah. 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 They would meet at Bonnie View for like birthday, family birthday parties and things like that. And also before she was going to prison, he had her come up because he did a whole photo shoot of her to document how she looked before she went into prison in case she was abused while she was in there. He wanted to be able to show that she was totally fine before she went in. Thanks, honey. I appreciate that. Wow. Right. That's crazy. So, you know, and also, Janice, didn't they write to each other on almost on a daily basis too? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they did. But after, but after, um, after he took off with Pat and Annie, I don't know – if that continued, but beforehand he used to, they wrote each other every single day. And the messengers, we were after the raid, she kept talking about her lawsuit and bad news. So the he had the messengers, we had to go through and vet what she wrote him and retype. We detached the original, but we'd retype it without the bad news in it and give that to him. And then he would then dictate an answer and would sit there and type it up. And, but every day they wrote back and forth after 1980, when he left, I don't know how that worked. Hmm. Wow. And either way, she was kept in isolation until she died in 2002. Right. And with, with, uh, dedicated handlers to keep her, I'm yes, presuming. Spies. Yeah. yeah. Spies reporting, reporting on her. Yeah. Yes. Right. Similar to what Shelly has. Yeah. Yes. With, you know, at least three staff dedicated only to being at her side 24 seven, plus, you know, obviously security yeah. guards and whatever else. 
Yeah. And she knew Neville was reporting on her all the time. Yeah, Neville she Potter. Knew, she right? knew that. Yeah. Who also Neville, works yes. at Author Services. Yep. Yes. What was his wife's name? Is it Leslie? Leslie. Leslie, Leslie, Leslie and escaped Potter. and then was brought back at some point. Oh, wow. I don't know that she's still there or not, but Neville definitely is, I'm sure. Okay. I think this is a good point to do a few questions. If you guys want, we can do oh, Yeah, a absolutely. Q &A. Let's like do it. And we are going to do a merch giveaway at the end of this stream. So um, we'll do that. We're just going to randomly pick somebody. We're not going to use the fancy stream yard thing. We're just going to bullseye hit, hit a comment. Please subscribe to the channels too. Yes. Oh, that's right. We've got, uh, if you guys are watching on the blown for good channel, please go over to our Scientology stories, peeling the onion. Is that the right name of the channel? Yeah. We're actually thinking about shorting it, but that is the name. Yeah. Okay, good. Go to our Scientology stories, peel the onion and subscribe to Mark and Janice. And if you're watching on Mark and Janice's channel, come on over to the blown yeah. for good channel. <laughs> Get hit like, and subscribe <laughs> over here too. But um, we've got a whole bunch of questions starred. I'm going to um, put them up and I'm going to let Claire read them because um, Claire and Janice and Mark and I have been doing the most amount of talking. So I'm think we should I get know. some I'm Claire sorry. talking. I'm sorry, Claire. Um, no, that's all right. <laughs> it's okay. okay. Go. All it, good. I, I ain't, ain't say, say that. that. <laughs> this seems easy. Hubbard died rich and had the cult stable. Dave didn't earn his position, didn't modernize the cult, and made it a viral laughing stock. Yep, that's true. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We Dave, knew that, that I ain't say that. That sums it up. Summed yeah. it up perfectly. And that's yeah. also before the video started. They wrote that. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Okay, thank you. I ain't say that. Um, Japan of Green Gables. Japan of Green Gables. Question, is it just a coincidence that David Miscavige's family in the Sea Org had high-ranking positions, or was it nepotism? Good question. They didn't really have high-ranking positions. I wouldn't say Ron Sr. was a well, high position. Ronnie. No, Ronnie Miscavige and, and Biddy, his wife, were... Yeah, but Biddy also well, was already a senior executive before she married yeah. Ronnie. I yeah. was going to say, Biddy was already a rock star before David Mis D David Miscavige, I don't think, had anything to do with yeah. her rise to power. Yeah. Right. And, I think and it, Ronnie, yeah. Ronnie was the deputy commanding officer of the Commodore's Messenger Org in Clearwater under Mike Rinder. Well, well, Dave was up being just a cameraman. So it wasn't. You know, there was no connection there. But later on, yes, he brought him in as marketing exec in. That's yes. right. And to be clear, Miscavige is the only one left of his family in the Sea Organization. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have yeah, a single exactly. brother, sister, mother, father, right. anything that has anything to do with the Sea Org. And he, whatever peripheral family family members that are still left, they ain't. Uh, uh, they ain't blue star or gold star uh, Scientologists either. No. So right. I <laughs> think he always, he constantly complained about his mother because she was always doing things that would reflect poorly on him. And the same with Denise, his twin sister. He was always well, complaining about how they're bad PR for him. Well, Janice, his tell mother quick, used tell to tell a story about his mother not calling him sir. Tell that story real quick. <laughs> well, actually, she when he was a kid, she used to call him little Hitler because of yeah. his attitude and nastiness. And you know, he'd try and stop fights, and Ronnie would then have to finish the fights or clean things up. But there was a time a bunch of us were going skiing up at Big Bear, Big Bear. and Lorette. Loretta came with us, and there was Dave and Shelley, myself and Paul, Ray Midoff and Gelda, and Rick and Vicky. And we're going up there, and Dave is getting mad at his mother because she's not calling him sir. <laughs> and he, he was like, pull over, and, you know, he then insists on, Loretta, you come with me, and takes her into the restaurant, and he's in there arguing with her. She still wouldn't call him sir. But, <laughs> and she wasn't Sea Org. Yeah, no, well, that, right. Ron Miscavige told me that when he was little, they called him when they first got into Scientology and they were learning the terms, they learned the term N theta, which means in turbulated theta. Right. It just means in, somebody who's yeah. just angry all the time, N theta. Right. And they used to call him Enrique N theta. 
That was his right. actual <laughs> nickname was Enrique Infeta. And I always, when Ron Scavage Sr. told me that, I thought, that is the best nickname for that dude that I've ever heard. <laughs> Enrique <laughs> <Yeah>. Infeta. <laughs> okay, blow drill. Uh, this is Dylan. He says, I built the LRH houses up at CST and no clothing was set out. Yeah, right. as far as I understand, because I asked about that as well, because they have L. Ron Hubbard offices all over the world. And they also have these L. Ron Hubbard houses all over the world. And some of them are at these CST locations. There is a house there. So if L. Ron Hubbard needs to hide out with all his materials, there's a house there to do it. They're not setting out clothes at those places because the dude only had so many clothes. And all of those are at the main house. The BV. BV is the, the mothership of the L. Ron Hubbard houses, if, uh, as you were. Okay, let's do another comment. Okay, Claire, I'm going to turn it back over to you to read. Okie dokie. Gary Jackson Moorhead. I used to walk into Bonnie View all the time, went on watch and watched the clothes and shoes being laid out, getting washed in his huge closet with all the platform shoes, boots, belts, ascots, etc. Yeah. There you go. It was the 70s. That's the truth. All those clothes were pretty much 70s clothes that I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Gary Jackson Moorhead again. He had tab and cactus coolers in the fridge at BV. Oh. Okay. Now I'm not a big fan of tab, but you give me a cactus oh, cooler yeah. and I'm right on board with that kind of <laughs> oh, yeah. that green Sugary, and kind good, of yeah. orange kind of with the little cactus. Oh my goodness. I love me a cactus cooler. Yep. Uh, Jason Polycron video idea. What law enforcement agencies have you worked with to expose Scientology? L. Wrong Hubbard. How did it go? How were you treated? Yes, there you go. Current, current, um, yeah, that's a great video idea over the, the ages. Current stuff, we're not at liberty to speak about everything specifically. The, the, the experience that I've personally had with law enforcement has been positive in the in in terms of Scientology. I haven't had any bad um experiences with law enforcement in regards to dealing with Scientology that I can think of right off right off hand. Mo the only thing is there's a, there is a little bit of frustration in how they deal with and act on the information that we provide them. The the wheels what do they say the wheels of justice uh, seem to turn very slowly. Um that's what I'll say. Yeah. Dr. Nova, at what point did Hubbard's mind finally break and he began, began his slide into totally believing his own bull? Uh, because it would seem, at least at the beginning, that he still understood it was a scam. That's a hard question for us. Well, to answer. Yeah, I know that when we were on the ship in the 60s and the 70s, he believed in what he was doing. Who else would stay up all night till six or eight in the morning, case supervising folders and directing people on what to do to how to help people? I mean, I mean this is his opinion that he was helping people. And th this is a person who didn't go off to the movies. He, you know, maybe every, maybe a month or two, he might go for a car drive or a motorbike ride. But everything he did, was to market Scientology, to come up with trying to help people. And he didn't do other things, you know, like Miss Gavage, he's off, you know, scuba diving here and doing whatever and just having a grand old time making, but trying to make people think he's working. Right. Where Hubbard was working to enhance Scientology. And I believe he believed in what oh, he yeah. was doing. Yeah. I yeah. think Hubbard may not agree with what he was doing. But I believe that he <laughs> believed it too. He believed what he was doing up to the day's die to the point where he had CST set up with all the vaults and the this and the that. I mean, yeah, you could say he was crazy about it. that. Was crazy, but he definitely yeah. believed what he was doing. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Miscavige believes in what no. they're doing. I think he just wants to have the money and the power. And if he has to play along and pretend that all the Scientology stuff is real, then that's that's a, not a big price to pay to to be able to live like a king until he... he, no, until I, he I, and work. I just read in Mitch's book about the ideal orgs that he had this bright idea. Oh, if we build all these real estate bride, you know, these orgs, 
people will magically come once we have these palaces built. Right. I mean, that is so delusional. Yeah. I mean, Mitch writes the whole story about the whole thing. I'm going like, what do you get? Build it and they will come. I mean, this is not Field of Dreams. And, to be, you know? and to be fair, Hubbard said not to do that. Right. <laughs> exactly. He said that the ex he and said if you want to grow Scientology, don't do the things that David Miscavige has been doing since David Miscavige. And, and Hubbard's, right. as a manager, Hubbard's main viewpoint was value of services delivered. How much backlog services have not been delivered? All he cared about was delivery. He didn't care about the income as much as the delivery because he knew if he didn't deliver, people would not continue to be Scientologists and you wouldn't grow, you know? Anyway, yeah. I'm not saying it's right, yeah. but I'm just saying he, he yeah. was dedicated to, to expanding. Yep. Yeah, witness. Wow, sounds like a high stress job for a kid. Yeah, I think that one came in when um, Janice is what are you were talking about up ready to go on to uh, watch. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, uh, Jenny, are Amy and Matt okay? They have been absent from YouTube for a while. Yes, I think they posted a notice on their community tab on their channel. They moved, so yes. they have yes. to they bought a new house. Yeah, so I think once they get all settled into their new place, uh, then or just keep track on their channel if you want to know what they're doing on their channel. That's probably the best place to. Uh, to find it but they're definitely yeah, but they're okay good. thanks for asking yeah. metalhead has has david miscavige ever claimed to have any superhuman abilities that's common among cult leaders no he has asthma as <laughs> <laughs> i will tell he has you, the superhuman ability to frequently abuse physically abuse staff that's for he holds sure. on to copper yeah. rods in the ground yeah oh when gosh. we were when i was at the um in base at the golden air productions uh, for many years, when I was first there, I was on the night shift. And I tell this story in my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, um, that one time we were, I was doing shredding or we were going to mid rats, the midnight rations meal in the middle of the night. And as we were walking to um, the eating, the dining hall from where our production space, we saw David Miscavige in what was called at that time, it was called the Cine Lodges. And it was these these kind of bungalows that were right next to the dining hall that used to be like little apartments and they turned them into be offices. Where I lived. I, used to live I there. lived down there too. You live near the talent? Where, where did you right live? Right next to MCI. As a matter of fact, the talent office was Julie and my There you birthing. go. That was I my remember that. Yeah. I remember I, hearing yeah. that that's where you- I was on the, I was other on the side. other side, the parking lot side. The so very first one next to MCI. To MCI. That one became the Which, art department. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the, the cinematography division moved into all these bungalows. And when we were walking down to go eat one night, we saw David Miscavige. He was in there, but he was by himself. He didn't have his entourage. He was just in there and he was digging through the drawers. And we thought, that's weird. And then, um, you know, it was just him. And I kind of, we kind of paused and we looked and it's like, oh, it's, it's chairman of the board in there doing something. Anyway, so then we go and we go eat. Well, then we would uh, work until the, the morning. And then after breakfast, we would go home and we'd sleep all day. And then we'd come home. At, we'd get back to work at dinner time, everyone else's dinner time, which would be our proper breakfast and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, as soon as we get to the base, we have dinner. And then there's a muster, a crew muster. And it's a big flap. Supposedly, David Miscavige walked in to the cine division in the middle of the day and he they he was doing like a surprise inspection and he pointed to like the third drawer of one of the the sea org members desks and said open up that drawer right there and they opened it up and there was a pair of shoes like a really nasty stinky like just uh, gag uh gags smelling shoes in there and there was a bunch of other junk deodorant which you would never put in your desk drawer that's like a a, a, a sin in the sea org and people were like, Dave, uh, Mr. Miscavige, is, he's like OT. He knew exactly which drawer had the dirty shoes in it. And they're telling these stories. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, this mother, this mf -er, he stacked the deck last night. He went through the whole place. He looked through every single drawer. And he just had to remember which one had the shoes in it. And he comes in the next day with the whole entourage and everybody and just 
cherry picks one drawer out of the whole place. And, and this happened all the time with him over the 15 years we were at the base where he would just magically find stuff. And I would always think, yeah, well, if you can go through someone's, cause he lived on the property. Most other people who worked at that property, they lived in apartments nearby in yeah. town. So yeah. he's the only one who could just, and he was on his own schedule. So he could stay up till six o'clock in the morning, digging through desks if he wanted to, and then come in in the afternoon the next day and show up for work. So anyway, those were the superpowers that he had for whoever asked that question. <laughs> um, OBG Foster question. Was everybody more relaxed whenever LRH was away? Yes. Yeah. Same, same with uh, David Miscavige, for yeah, sure. Yeah, when Dave would bug out, <laughs> we'd be like, party! Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know about party, but it well, certainly wasn't. You wouldn't be worried if you were going to be sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force that day. Yeah, but we're not <laughs> staying up all night for to True. do work for somebody who right. ain't even there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, Japan of Green Gables. I bet if someone saved over... Miscavige's save file on the N64, they'd be sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force. <laughs> well, to be fair, this is a super geeky uh, comment, but um, um, when David Miscavige would play Nintendo, he loved Super Mario's, by, by the way. He was the biggest Super Mario Brothers fan I've ever seen. So much so that one time, and Claire may remember this, one time in the early 1990s, the whole property was supposed to go or people that were allowed to went up to Big Bear for a ski trip. And I got sent up two days earlier to set up the, these audio visual systems I was telling you about. I had to set one of those up at a, at a ski lodge up in Big Bear. And I had to get a, a Nintendo with Super Mario Brothers and all the, the games he liked. And I had to set up a whole TV and speakers and cassette deck and all this other stuff. So that when he got there, that Super Mario Brothers was warmed up and ready to go for him. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, um, Japan of Green Gables. El Cadiz, nuts. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on with the comments today? Um, here we go. <laughs> Cheyenne Calkins. Wasn't Hubbard also against donations for nothing in exchange? Seems that's the main thing for yes. David Miscavige. Yep, yes, completely. He was. Plus, he was against events. Yeah, yep. pretty much everything. Don't build yeah. buildings to be nice. Don't have you don't have to have a nice building. You just have to deliver right. the way and have it clean. Yeah, it have a clean, clean, nice building. And and any Scientologist that's been in Scientology for the last thirty or forty years, they'll tell you they used to go to an organization. Their local organization was in a strip mall, and they were busting at the seams. And there was tons of people there, and the parking lot was full, and blotty, 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 blah. And yeah. today they've got a palatial mansion that used to be a museum, and there's three cars in the parking lot, right. and that's the mm -hmm. most there ever is. Yep. Right. Exactly. Um. OBG Foster, question, does David Miscavige make a point of telling people about his luxury trips? Um, yes, to the staff at the base, sometimes he would he would put up displays of photos and um, but didn't, yeah. didn't he do a slideshow? Yes, he <laughs> well, did. To call it a slideshow is a misnomer. It was <laughs> Ben Hur, the slideshow. It was like a three hour underwater oh fishing slideshow <laughs> that we all had to watch and it was it had a music score the slideshow had a freaking oh. music score okay this was us I, I had to watch him i had to watch him skydiving with tom cruise he came home with a video and showed it to us in his office yeah and so by my recollection the only purpose that he gave in showing us these trips was to show that he was a complete professional and everything he touched do you remember a different message mark <sighs> i think i slept through most of his presentations <laughs> but to tell you the truth um i think that was his excuse for making us watch a three-hour uh, underwater fish uh, slideshow that he had produced and uh, took pictures of but the worst part is that we had um almost all the stuff he used was stuff that the sea org members bought him for his birthday so right all that's i remembered was that's where my 40 bucks went from my pay is so that i could see a freaking clown fish in aruba you know like <laughs> i was sort of like i would have rather have had the 20 or 40 bucks okay 
<laughs> which, which was paid for by donations to the IAS. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because he used IAS funds for that. Yeah. Yep. No, he was definitely um, he was definitely a shady character. Um, oh, here's one from Jackson. Gary Jackson Moorhead. I used to hang with Paco at Bonnie View all the time. He told me a lot of stories. I bet he did. <laughs> yeah, Paco has all kinds of stories. I would I would say uh, at least half of them took place. Um, <laughs> I agree Denny. with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. Paco was a storyteller, and sometimes he 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 he. Uh, he ventured off from the truth path a little. Okay, then. Well, pa Paco was an assistant steward. He was not the one that helped LRH get dressed. The messengers did that. Mm. Oh, but somebody really did help him get dressed, though. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Wow. Yep. All right, Matt Denny. Question, how did Dave stage his coup? How did he manage to wrestle control from Pat and Annie Broker? I think we kind of kind of led into kind of covered it but we also have a video on our channel uh our scientology stories peeling the onion that covers that exact story from beginning to end so if you Perfect. go to our channel and look under um i have it on a playlist on david miscavige tom cruise and shelly and mm -hmm. it'll be on there okay we'll Perfect. put a link to that in the description so you guys can see that as well if you want to just click on it um okay we've got a few more questions left here let's see what we got them up um i don't think that you said he you cut his crackers you would just open the can for him for the the, the corned beef <laughs> yeah but we well there'd be crackers that we would get and we'd cut up cheese to go okay. on the crackers okay, Mark, you could have had you could have had a job as an assistant messenger licking the crackers <laughs> oh, you know, the well, crackers. as soon as you said the word cracker i knew i was in for it as soon as i you said cracker liquor. I was like, oh, here we go. Here yeah. we go, everybody. Every Good job, Mark wasn't around. He would have licked those crackers so fast. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. As soon as I, as soon as you said cracker, I was like, you really just had to say crack. You could have said cookies or sweets. <laughs> Anything they but were crackers. crackers. Yeah. Susan B. at Blown for Good. All my sweat merch has come in handy this winter. So warm and cozy. Yes. Nice. Oh, nice. Thank you, Susan. Uh, e. Dunbar, question. Do you think Crazy Davy is paranoid because he knows it's all BS and he has to keep the game going? LRH probably believed it was real. No paranoia. Yeah, I'd, pro I'd agree yeah, with that yeah, assessment. I agree. Yeah. Awesome. I think that David Miscavige has Hubbard trumped in terms of his uh, capacity to weasel and strategize himself into power. Um, bully every anyone else that was a threat out of the picture completely bully the IRS into giving Scientology tax exempt status and then continuing to amass millions of dollars while weaseling himself further and further out of the public eye and doing everything he can to now, I think, make Scientologists believe he's the reason everything is wonderful. That's right. That's that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Susan B. Oh, my God. To think. T Tom Cruise and David Miscavige are friends is a pretty lonely life or I don't know Scientology needs to be gone pure evil this man is yep absolutely that sums <clears throat> it up he's actually the one who's chasing more people out of there than anybody yep mm -hmm. Catherine Olson most Sea Org members where I was think David Miscavige is some sort of amazing OT operating Thetan who knows everything. Yes, that he has superpowers, that he is the penultimate Scientologist. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not going to try and read that name. I cannot tell the panel here how important all this information about this cult for those of us who don't know. Well, thank you. Thanks for Perfect. joining us and thanks for being here. Uh, Japan of Green Gables question who replaced Marty as IG ethics when he was promoted to total IG um, Marty became IG at least inspector general in 1998 and by that time David Miscavige had eliminated the the IG ethics uh, inspector general for ethics position so by that time nobody did yeah it was just COB and IG that's yep. all there was left. Oh, okay. And then and then eventually he got rid of the IG too. So there was no inspector general, just COB, and then a bunch of people that worked in RTC. So yep. um, he actually ended up 
getting rid of the stop gaps that were in his own organization to make sure that there was not one person controlling everything as he did with all of the other organizations. Yeah. And so. just to add one comment to that, the, um, the IG position became deputy inspector general because David Miscavige said, well, he is inspector general COB yeah. and inspector yeah. general are one in the same position is what the final analysis was by the time we got the heck out of there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we did a good job answering questions and I think we did a good job talking about all the stuff and all the toys these two guys had to play with. Yeah. And I want to say that um, of the two cult leaders, I think L. Ron Hubbard came out on top. He was genuinely invested and he really thought he was doing what he thought he was doing. And I do agree with the sentiment that David Miscavige is just kind of playing along so he can enjoy the benefits of what happened. And it also doesn't seem like an accident that he ended up being the one in charge. He was thinking right. and striving for this the entire time. Uh, once he got the idea, it was he was a man on a mission to make this happen. And even when he was thwarted from time to time, he was somehow somehow overcame it somehow, some way. Master um, manipulator, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, there's one other thing I'm looking. I'm looking. No, I think we're good. Um, okay. So do we want to do, um, if you want to do a giveaway, should we do a giveaway? If you want to just yep. say merch or book me or, you know, whatever you want. Um, we have a setup on Blown for Good where if you want something from the Blown for Good merch store, you just have just have to tell us and um, you send Claire uh, or, or write in through the Blown for Good website. And then Claire will just send you a link and you can pick out what you want. If it's a book or a sweater or a mouse pad or a mug or whatever, and you just get sent it. Yep. Well, they have to pick pick the item first and then send yeah. me the link. And but yeah, that, we'll that give works. You a link to get it for nothing. Yes, there we go. So we'll Let's give everybody it. a few minutes. Thanks for joining us. Again, if you haven't subscribed to um, our Scientology stories, Peeling the Onion, um, head on over there. Give them a give them a like and a subscribe over on their channel. That always helps. Um, we don't, uh, you know, none of us does this for a living, but uh, we could be doing other things, if you know what I mean. So when we get a little like and a little subscribe and, you know, you help the channel, maybe get some merch or something, that it gives us a little bit more incentive to do this right. because, you know, I could just be sitting up watching football right now. I don't have to be here doing this. <laughs> what were you going to say, Janice? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that next Saturday night at 5 o'clock, I am going to be downtown Clearwater. Oh. So, yeah. So if anyone wants to come and meet me, chat with me, ask any questions, or even bring their books and have me sign them, my books that I wrote, um, I'll be there five o'clock next Saturday. Someone nice. shows up with a copy of Ben Hur. They're like, Janice, can you sign my book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> all right. Well, we got a bunch of uh, merch comments. You want? You gonna pick oh, yeah. some? Someone, honey? Sure, I'll pick one. Here we go. Okay. We're gonna do it. Um, five, do... four, there three, two, down. one. <laughs> Poof! What do we got? Oh, Matt, yeah. Denny. Have we? Has he won before? Nope. I don't. Oh, I don't believe wow. so. There you go, Matt. He's so. a frequent flyer. Throw a Brita bone, merch. Me. Yes, definitely. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, Matt, send me an email, Claire at blownforgood.com, and let me know what you would like. Congratulations. Nice. Okay, you want to do one more, and then we'll uh, we'll yes. close this. Shut this. We'll shut this party down. Yes. Okay. Here we go. And skadoosh. Love food kitchen, love food kitchen. Janice. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, I'd like to sign my books. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, love food kitchen. Well, we not Janice is not. Uh, she's in a different state than us, so that's not going to work. But whatever you'd like, congratulations, you win something. <laughs> Just yeah. let me know what you would like. <laughs> Okay, guys, I think we did it. I think awesome. we, uh, we're going to shut this thing down. Thanks for everybody who joined. And uh, thanks for everybody who watched. We, Claire and I are going to do another um, live tomorrow. And we are going to um, do that right around the same time, I think. So um, if there's not already a notice up on the channel, we'll put one up so you can, uh, so you can, if you click the bell notification, it'll tell you when we go live. 
so you know. So if you're watching or doing something else, then uh, you get a little notice. But uh, I'm um, take this comment down. Here. Someone has just asked where. So I just, this is probably in reference to my downtown Clearwater. Clearwater. There's yes. three restaurants there that are non Scientology owned. Uh, downtown pizza, tequila, and something else. Any okay, I'm gonna have dinner probably at tequila, and that's where they can probably find me. We'll we'll post a notice too on our on our YouTube channel, you know, the community tab. Janice, when you know where you're gonna be, we'll just post it there right. so people know where it is. Yeah. Stay safe, Janice. Stay safe. Yeah. And don't I will. It too far ahead of time because then they'll know where you they'll do their work. We had a we had an event where we went to Clearwater. A whole bunch of us went down to Clearwater to have a whole bunch of people show up. And yeah. Scientology made it so we couldn't go to any restaurant in downtown. They <laughs> turned us away saying, oh, we don't have enough uh, tables for your group or we don't have oh. this. Or, and we were just like, really? Oh, my gosh, guys. Okay. Well, the place is dead. But it was yeah. dead when we when we moved there in 75. It was dead then, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, thanks a lot. That was fun. That was a different yeah, video. So. We don't normally do videos like this. Um, so this was great. And um, yeah, thanks again, yeah, We love doing it. Thanks, everybody. Yes. We'll thanks. see you Bye. next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help support the channel, feel free to check out the merch store link in the description. We have Hail Xenu, Xenu is my homeboy, and BFG branded mouse pads, shirts, mugs, all sorts of other stuff in there that helps us to bring you new content on a regular basis. You can also pick up a copy of my book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, in hardback, Kindle, and Audible versions as well. There's also a link to our podcast, and you can get that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to watch another video, you can click on this link right here, or you can click on this one here, or you can click on the subscribe button right here. Thanks a lot. Until next time.